Good morning. My name is Pastor Scott Harper with Hope of the Generations Church and Be in Help. I want to thank you for joining us today to watch the premiere of Overcoming Depression with Dr. Henry W. Wright. Depression is an epidemic running rampant through our modern society. It is often considered a life sentence with only the continued crutch of medication to help somebody have some sense of normalcy for those affected by it. What if I told you that it doesn't have to be that way? God is so much greater than the bondage of depression and He has provided a way of escape for you. His will for you is not just survival, but that you would truly thrive in the relationship with Him, yourself, and others. Now this conference is around five hours long. Don't worry, we're going to take plenty of breaks in between. Just make sure you stick with us throughout the entire time because we have some exciting offers just for you for watching today. God bless you and enjoy. The joy of the Lord is somebody else's strength. The joy of the Lord is you just took ownership of something. And the day that you take ownership of something, it's either for good or not so good. You have to decide what you're going to take ownership in. It's your life. You can't blame God. You can't blame even the devil, you can't blame your friends. He said, well, I, it's just if there wasn't a devil, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a problem. Yes, you would. We still got you to deal with. <laughs> Come on now, I'm having some fun with you. I, um, I'm going to approach this subject all day, trying to keep it as non-clinical as possible. And to give you an insight into the inner workings of the various types of depression. Um, the problem we have in, even in the church today in dealing with the various forms of depression, we somehow forget that we're a triune being. And so everything is inner healing. Everything is soul management. And then, of course, we use what I call chemicals to manage our imbalances without even considering what's causing the imbalance. So we end up in a drugged state temporarily to keep us from hurting ourselves and hurting others. That's not exactly how it should go. Now, the world is filled with hopelessness and anger and despair. No question. They have no hope. You're, if you're born again, you are sons and daughters of the living Father. You should have a good day. Why not? Your Father's God. I mean, what's wrong with that? And you have a birthright and you have a future that even transcends death that the world does not have. And so I'd like to take you on a journey. You know, um, at some point, I, I will talk about your, who you are as a triune being. You are a spirit. You have a soul, and you live in a mobile home. You're not the mobile home. You live inside the mobile home. And uh, I, with tongue in cheek, sometimes I like to pick with the medical community and the psychiatric community. I said, pick, have a little fun, because they're not treating you as a triune being. They're treating you as a being that has a soul sewn on animals. So they're really treating us like an animal, and they think we're an animal. Because in their schools of learning and through zoology and the rest of the study of anatomy and physiology, they've come to the conclusion that's all we are. I said to someone the other day, 
it might be better, and if you're a doctor here, a doctor listening, just realize I'm trying to make a point and not trying to be disrespectful to your industry. But I told somebody the other day, it might be better if you went to a veterinarian than your local doctor. At least a veterinarian will pat you on the head, scratch you behind the ear, occasionally a pat on the butt, and say, good, bo good boy. That is very therapeutic. Come on now. If somebody would just scratch you behind the ear, pat you on the head, on the butt, you would be happy. But they don't. They tell you how awful you're doing and how they can help make you feel awful better. Come on now. This is the truth. You know it's the truth. So I, uh, you know, I have a doctorate in Christian uh, therapeutic counseling, big deal. All that means is that I understand you from the inside out. So I'm not going to approach depression from managing your physiology through drugs or through therapy or through guided imagery or through whatever the modality that they're trying to do to keep you from floating off your chair and to keep you earthbound a little longer. Now, we're not going to go there. But at the same time, I think I need to deal with some of the uh, clinical terms. Just from a standpoint of education, I'd like to take this time to do so. Depression involves being depressed. Isn't that startling? And what is depressed is you're in a lack of elevated mood. So things are down, things are downer. And uh, you've fallen off your chair. Because if you're believers, the word says you've been seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, far above all principalities and powers. So in depression, you fall off your heavenly seat down with the beggarly elements of the world, and you end up swimming with that mess. And then you think it's you. I tell people that have disease, I said, you may have a disease, but you're not a disease. When God created you, he didn't say, there's my beloved diseased son and daughter, who I am well pleased. So something has joined us that's not of God. Would you agree with that? You may have depression, but you're not depression. If I can remove the disease and I can remove the mood swings and the depression, guess who I have left? You without the problem. That's the gospel. But the gospel doesn't involve just healing. Everybody wants some anointed person to come along and zap them. That's what they're looking for, some anointed zapper. And many of you have been zapped by anointed people, and you still are the same as before you got zapped. And so they don't know what to do with it. They just keep zapping you in Jesus' name, hoping it sticks one day. Not realizing that the problems we have are the byproduct of a journey, spirit, soul, and body. Now, depression is a state of being, or could I say a being that currently is in state with a certain mindset. And that person can have an aversion to activity, an aversion to be around people. They go into isolation. They withdraw. One of the, one of the worst things that can hurts you in depression is withdrawal. One of the first things that can help you heal from depression is come out of isolation. Plan to be around people you don't like. That'll really challenge you. You'll know you're doing better if you survive that. But we don't deal with life. We withdraw. And so that's all part of it. And it involves your thoughts, your behavior, your feelings, your sense of well-being. Uh, people with a depressed mood can feel sad. They can feel anxious. 
they can feel empty, they can feel hopeless, helpless, worthless, guilty, irritable, ashamed, or restless. They may even lose interest in activities that were once pleasurable to them. They may experience overeating or loss of appetite, have problems concentrating, remembering details, or making decisions. They may even contemplate or even attempt or commit suicide. They'll develop insomnia, excessive sleeping, fatigue, aches, pains, digestive problems, or reduced energy may also be present. Yuck. I didn't feel good already. Now, there may be a depressed mood, and let me say this to you. It is probably normal to experience bouts of sadness or loss because of life circumstances. But usually we recover because we, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we live by godly principles which defeat the things that are not of God. And we usually come out of that. Also, you may not understand, and I'll deal with this later in this conference, we don't understand temptation. We don't understand the source of temptation. God doesn't tempt you. You may have an original thought that's not good, and that's certainly possible. But we don't really, and aren't taught in the Christian church, that we still can be tempted by an invisible kingdom that answers to Satan. It is very clear in Ephesians that your battle, your war, is not with flesh or blood. What does that mean? Your battle is not even with yourself. Are you flesh and blood? Surprise, surprise. Why would you become your own enemy? Be kind to yourself. Your battle is not even with yourself. Your battle is not even with others which stuff is manifesting that makes you feel sad or, or rejected or abandoned or whatever the case may be. Your battle isn't even with them. But your battle is with principalities and powers. Your warfare is with principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in the darkness of this world. That's your battle. Invisible beings. Now those invisible beings, and I'm going to teach you this today, how they speak to you and by which channel. To give you thoughts and feelings as if it were your own mind. Church, you are so easy to be influenced by that other kingdom. It gives you a thought, you take ownership, and we'll see you later. That's how it's happening. That's how, it, how you've been had, is that you're not taking ownership of rejecting or even doing inventory of your own soul, personality, and spirituality. Because you have a, had a thought does not mean you have to take ownership of it. There's not one person here that's immune to temptation. There's not one person here that's not immune to the feelings of hopelessness and despair and fear and anxiety and bitterness and rejection. There's not one person here that is, doesn't experience those thoughts traveling through your consciousness, either by actual thought or by feelings, emotions, or impressions. Not one person here. Every day, it's like ticker tape on Fifth Avenue. Now, you don't have to tune into it. You don't have to take ownership of it. My new thing this year about temptation and things that are not of God is flush it. I'm not trying to be, you know, disrespectful to the toilet. But I tell people, I've told people this year, I said, if you go, you know, and you drop some logs in the toilet, you don't invite your friends over to come look at the architectural structure. 
or to enjoy the aroma. You don't call your friends and say, you've got to come see this stuff in the toilet. It came out of me. And they probably would say, it's about time. But why do we embrace things that are just as disgusting? I like that word. I heard it in the audience. Just as non-essential. God created you to flush things that aren't good for you. Then why don't we learn to flush our souls and our spirits, not just our bodies? Come on now, I'm giving you a parable. All the religious spirits are all upset now. So I don't think a man of the cloth should talk this way. Not a man of the cloth, I'm your brother. Are you tracking with me? Maybe that's how you defeat depression. Flush it. Quit taking ownership of things that aren't of God. You say, yeah, but there's that goat. I ain't a sheep. Sheep never say, yeah, but. They go, amen. Amen. Goats go, yeah, but. Well, no matter what you say, you got to rebuttal. No matter what you try to say positive, you got this spiritual sass. Because the person doesn't want to change. Depressed mood is a feature of some psychiatric syndromes, such as major depressive disorders. This is clinical stuff. This is what man says is happening to you. They've got you stereotyped and categorized. They'll find you in the DSM-5 manual. I can find you just as quick as that and tell you all about you. I can go to the DSM-5 manual, and there you are. No, that's what you shouldn't be. So it's easy to classify people in their hopelessness and despair, but not, want, not many people in the industry of psychiatry and medicine know how to prevent it. I'm going to teach you how to prevent it in this conference. I'm going to tell you how to understand it and prevent it. And then if it's come, how to get released from it. It's your birthright. You know, there may be normal reactions in life to such things as loss, bereavement, and all this. They're also, when you're on all the antidepressants and all the other drugs that they're given to try to manage your biochemistry and balance, Every drug you take has a side effect. You know certain antidepressants produce depression? You know certain antidepressants that are given to children increase suicidal ideation? Do you know the side effect of a drug is another problem? Do you know the side effect of a drug is another disease or disorder? And then you've got to take another drug to balance the side effect of the drug and you into polypharmacy. And the new drug you're cu coming to, ba to balance the side effects of the first drug has its own side effects. And all of a sudden, you're a chemical experiment. And your body's gone wacko. This is not God's will. It is not what he created. When God created Adam and Eve... He didn't say it was good. He said it was very good. So what happened to very good? We're going to teach you what happened to very good in this conference. Let me skip through some of this mumbo-jumbo. There are things that happen in, in life in childhood. There's neglect. There's unequal parental treatment of siblings. That would be favoritism, which create rejection. There's physical abuse, there's verbal abuse, there's sexual abuse, there's life circumstances that we encounter that certainly affect us and make us feel feelings, say feelings. A feeling may not be real. 
Our feeling may just be temptation. If God be for you, who can be again you? That's my way of saying it. Uh, if God be for you, who can be against you? So who cares if somebody doesn't like you? They don't like God then. I said if they don't like you, they don't like God. So why would you want to hang out with people that don't like God? He's the author of life. He's the author of sanity. He's the author of health and life and everything that's good. That's what you got at the cross unless you want to go back and live the old life. I thought it was called a new life. Then how come we bring the old life with us? Because we're comfortable with the failures of the past. Or comfortable with it. We have something to talk about. We want people to come in and look at our stuff. That in our self-pity, we, we can bring them down to our level of commiserating about the failure of things. Get a few people to agree with us that we really are worthless. And when they try to say you're not, we go, huh, tell me about it. This is the way I feel. So I suppose the Scripture should read this way. For as many as are led by their feelings are the sons of God. Now, what does that Scripture say? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. If you're going to be ruled by your feelings, no Spirit of God there. Now, it's okay to have feelings that are productive and positive. That's part of your soul expression. So being happy is normal. Being unhappy is abnormal. Having hopelessness and despair is abnormal. Having hope is normal. Having fear is abnormal. Having faith is normal. When did we decide to stay abnormal? I thought the cross made it possible that we could be changed into normal. I'm going to ask you to take ownership of your life. If not, then this is a fear conference. Because to take ownership of your life, you're going to have to mix it with your faith and the Word of God that speaks about who you are and who He is. And why would you die because of the sins of another against you? And why are you taking all the sins of these goofy people into your bodies and believing their lies against you? It's what he said is true. He said, but I'm, I'm, but, but I'm, but, 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 but I've sinned and I'm, but, 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 so what? There is none righteous. Welcome to the crew. I said, there is none righteous. Welcome to the crew. But if we confess our goofiness, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. But we don't even take time to repent because we love self-pity more than faith. Self-pity is a superglue of hell that binds you to the past. This is your life. You have the Spirit of God in you. Get up and let God in you get on with it. Yeah, I say, yeah, but uh, uh, here we go, goats again. The goats of his pasture. Yeah, but you just don't understand. Tell Jesus about that. He died for your sins, beaten, brutally, scourged, bloodied, and was forgiving those that just did it. Tell me about it. Say, Lord. There are things in life that cause distress. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous. But, but, the Lord delivers them out of them all. Tribulation 
The Bible says when these horrible things come upon you, you say, oh, why me? Oh, my God, I'm the worst. I'm the worm. I'm the slime. The Bible says when this horrible, fiery trial comes upon you, don't think that it's just special to you. But these are things that are common to man. Oh, it's just me. I'm the only one that God doesn't love. You're listening to the devil. God loves you. He proved it at the cross. Why didn't you say amen? Amen. So be it. Certain medications I mentioned are known to cause depressed mood in a significant number of patients. By the way, a lot of the things that are clinical, you don't need to be me to be an expert in or a clinician here today, do you? Listen, you're all pretty savvy with your computers. Just go to your web searches on depression. I'm quoting from Wikipedia. That's how smart I am. Aren't I smart? You know, when I quote from the Bible, I'm smart too. Why is there? So whether I get information from the Bible or I get it from the study of science or what man thinks he understands, it's just information, is it not? It's a resource of information. All of us don't know nothing. And those people that say that they know something haven't solved the problem yet. So I'm not going to say I know anything because you expect me to solve the problem. I, I'm sharing information with you that perhaps God can use it to help you prevent depression if you have it, get free of it, and then also make you expert in helping others. Because the information I'm giving to you is for you to use it with your friends and your families and strangers. That you can help them understand this incredible, dangerous pathway of thought and how it comes. Then you can help other people. Wouldn't that be good? Then you don't have to send them to me. You help. I don't want to be worn out. I don't want you to be worn out. You go help them. Yeah, it's good. There's a number of psychiatric syndromes. We're going to dip into some of them today because everybody's interested. And uh, the area, of course, would be um, bipolar, manic depression. Everybody wants to know about manic depression, bipolar. I'll get into that sometime today if I have, yeah, I think I'll get there. Um, there are some gender differences. I just want to go, this is Wikipedia, okay? <laughs> well, I'm giving credit for where it came from, aren't I? There are some gender differences. Um, that women have a higher rate of depression uh, than men. But the incidence of suicide are greater in men than in women. When we get into uh, inherited bipolar genetic um, it's about two to one females over males in bipolar inherited genetic bipolar X chromosome. And one of the reasons for that is interesting biologically because it's a defect that's inherited in the X chromosome. I'll get to that later. But females have two X chromosomes. Males only have one. So the incidence of the biological incidence a possibility and probability is double in females and males. If it's genetically inherited. And most professionals that I've, I've tracked in their, their studies and case histories feel that, uh, for the most part, most uh, bipolar is genetically inherited. And I'm going to show that to you in the charts um, well, maybe I'll do it now. The, every one of you has one of these. Do you see it inside your body? Yeah, it's in there. This happens to be the X chromosome. Down here in section 28, you see where it says manic depressive illness, X-linked? 
This is a recessive gene through the mother. Recessive gene through the mother. Now, I'm not going to teach you about that until later, but why the mother? So when someone comes around that has been diagnosed with uh, bipolar, manic depressive, this is bipolar, I'm looking to see if their mother has it or their grandmother because it's very common. It's familial. Track the word down, familial. That would be characteristic or to families. I'm going to get into familial spirits a little later to show you how there's a kingdom that's tracking your family tree and why. That kingdom is there to give your family tree thoughts. But usually the thoughts have already been in action because as far as I'm concerned, and listen carefully, if there is bipolar or manic depression inherited in the family tree, it indicates to me the failure of men to be proper husbands and fathers in the generations as far as you can look back. The father establishes the safety and the emotional well-being of the family, not the mother. Now, mom's great. But there has to be a male present that establishes a safe place. A safe place. Now, not everybody wants a safe place. It's amazing in creation. And you, you track with me on this one. That when a child is born and begins the journey of awakening to these strange people that have sounds coming out of their mouths and is beginning to understand that certain sounds is how they learn language is associated with that item or person the first person that they actually this is almost this is almost classic the first word that most children say male or female in the learning curve of speech is that that in English, is that that? Is that not true? Because God has birth within them in their creation looking for a father. Because that father is to represent God the Father of love from heaven. And after a while, mom's okay with that because the kid's talking something. But she's kind of killing rejected because she's wanting to hear mama. So she says, okay, Johnny, or Sally, uh, that's dada. Cool, you got it. Mama. And Johnny goes, dada. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not dada. I'm mama. Dada. If this flow of safety from the male is broken and no covering, we're going to wait right, right back to Adam today. This thing came in through Adam refused to cover his wife. In fact, he blamed her. It's that woman you gave me, Lord. I'd have been a spiritual man. But it's because of her. You know how many men won't be spiritual because they blame it on their wives? So she's oppressed, suppressed. This creates all kinds of spiritual problems in the flow of the generations. And there aren't blessings coming. Because blessings only belong to those that are doers of the word. You can read it for yourself in Deuteronomy 28. And it should come to pass, verse 1, if you hear what God said and you'll do it, then all, I like the word all, these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. 
Actually, it's a little stronger than that. Everybody today is into the prophetic. <sighs> okay. I'm going to give you a prophetic statement, but it's not coming from me. It's coming from the Word. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass. Is that prophetic? It's as prophetic as it comes. You don't need another word from the Lord. It's already there. And it shall come to pass if. So is the prophetic conditional. No one wants to make the prophetic conditional. God is true, but not all men and women want to be true to God's word. He'll never change. He says, I change not. But we want to change God's word because it requires that we change into his image. If you're going to defeat, defeat depression and prevent it, you're going to have to prepare to be changed into his image. And the Bible says from glory to glory, we are being changed, present progressive tense, into his image. Are being changed. God is not depressed. God has no fear. God has no bitterness. God has no hopelessness. God has none of the things that we struggle with. And if we've been made in his image, what in the world did we lose? His image. You got born again by the Spirit of God that then you could become the journey of being changed into his image. Not acting like you were before you got saved. But you had to take ownership. And it shall come to pass if the man or woman will hear what God says and do it. There's action. Not just knowledge, but action. Being a doer. Not just a hearer. Take ownership of You'll never defeat the enemy or depression if you don't take ownership for your life. It's your life. Get up. Take ownership. Quit blaming others because you're not happy. He's happy. You're his sons and daughters. Why aren't you happy? Being a son and daughter of God the Father, you should be ecstatic. Every day, ecstatic with joy and happiness that you have made peace with the Father of all spirits. You should be ecstatic. Yeah, son of God. Yeah, I am. Henry, son of God. Somebody says, no, you're a son of the devil. No, because you have an accusing, awful spirit. You didn't save me. He did. He saved me. He didn't need your permission to save me. He didn't need your permission to release the Holy Spirit to me. He didn't need your permission. He just decided. And if he decided, I say amen. I say amen to the amen who said amen to himself when he said amen when he said amen. Amen. So be it. And it should come to pass. It also says there in Deuteronomy, and it should come to pass in verse 16. Prophetic. And it should come to pass if. If means there's a condition. If you hear God, what God said, but you will not do what he said, then all these junky, yunky things should come upon you and overtake you. And in there is all manner of biological disease. In there is all manner of psychiatric disease. In there is losing your, your farm to foreclosure. Somebody else rapes your crop. Losing your wife to another man. Losing your business to bankruptcy. That's all in there. Even hemorrhoids are in there. Right there, hemorrhoids. A hemorrhoids are a blessing or a blank? If you think hemorrhoids are a blessing, I need to talk to you. And if you think hemorrhoids are a blessing, what are you going to a doctor trying to get rid of them? Say, thank God for my blessing. 
That's crazy. You're authenticating something that's not of God. Wow. What else can I tell you? So much of Wikipedia. Huh. More facts for you. What is depression? Is an illness. Now, I want to tell you something. That depression is not an illness. It's not a disease. It's a syndrome. There is nothing biologically wrong with the human brain. If there was something wrong with the human brain, it would be organic. It would be organic damage, maybe from injury or from birth defect or something of that nature. But when you start taking medicines or antidepressants or whatever, there's not, not, not one part of your body is being healed because there's nothing wrong with your body. Now, I'm going to get into neurotransmitter imbalances and chemical imbalances today. I'm going to talk about such things as uh, norepinephrine and uh, serotonin and dopamine because there are thoughts that can cause biochemistry imbalances over, it's called hypo or hyper, hypo under secretion of various neurotransmitters. And there's hyper, which is the overproduction of various neurotransmitters. So we're going to, we're going to get into some case histories today. From my experience of healing, people have been healed. As we take a look at what's causing, and specific diseases we'll talk about, such as paranoid schizophrenia, even right down to Parkinson's, is not a true disease either. Now, what's the difference? You go to a doctor, he's going to give you a diagnosis of what? The diagnosis is meaningless, but it's important to know what's malfunctioning in the body. I'm not against diagnosis. I'm against not dealing with the etiology. The word etiology means cause, causative. What causes this process? What causes the body to go into an imbalance of homeostasis? What causes uh, nerve signals to be interfered with? What, what causes hormones to be over-released or under-released? What causes neurotransmitters to be over-secreted or under-secreted? What, what is the causative action? You've got to learn that. So rather than give a drug to balance the imbalance, where is the sanity that says we need to stop what's causing the imbalance, thereby we won't need the drug to balance the imbalance? Did you get that? Let me say it again, because I'm a little slow too. Rather than giving a drug to try to balance the imbalance with all of its side effects, why don't we dig a little deeper and find out what is causing the imbalance, deal with what's causing the imbalance, deal with that so that there will not be an imbalance, and thereby there will be no need for the drug to balance the imbalance with all of the side effects, because what I offer to you is no drugs at all. Truth. You don't need a bunch of pills. You need one, the gospel pill. That's all you need. And there are no side effects. But you have to take ownership of truth and work it and live it. And you have to have your minds changed and your spirit man changed. And you're going to have to change your entire personality to be like him. And why not be like your father? He knows everything. I want to be like dad. Now, I had an earthly dad I didn't want to be like. Lord have mercy. I'm a preacher's kid. Did that tell you enough? (sighs) 
Depression involves mixture of the body responding to mood, thoughts, emotions. Anytime you don't deal with thoughts that are negative or thoughts that aren't making you feel good, it eventually will become part of your persona. What's persona? Your personality. The enemy knows how to train you into mood disorders. He knows how to entrap you with his personality. You're so easy. Your enemy and his kingdom, they don't even have to work up a sweat to defeat you. In fact, they figure you're defeated already because you're, oh, Lord, I don't want to use this word, ignorant. Of what? Satan's devices. But you're told in the word of God not to be ignorant of Satan's devices and his methods and his mythologies. And people don't know what to do when prayer doesn't work. It's all high vectors. Slap you with oil, knock you over, hope you get up well. We have a lot of damaged spines running around in the name of Jesus. It's all high vector. If you just had enough faith. No, you might need sanctification, not faith. You can use all the faith you want. You can high vector it, you can quote it, you can jump start it. But if you have something in your life that is empowering the enemy to afflict you, your faith will not work until you deal with a thing in which you gave ownership to the devil, and then your faith will work in defeating him. Come on. Get out of this superstitious church mentality. The church is, is writhing in superstition and vanity of conclusion. I just finished a, doing conferences across North America in the past three years, a survey of diseases in Christianity in various cities in North America. I put a table out. Maybe you, some of you have been to those conferences, and I put pieces of paper from A to Z, A for like alopecia or allergies or angina, and Z for zebratitis. And, you know, people do. I had a, in one conference... Uh, somebody put down, two people, but they struggle with zebratitis. It really was my humor, but it's really, I guess, a form of OCD. Uh, there are people that struggle, whether a zebra is white with black, black stripes or black with white stripes. That's good. That's good. That's good. Black stripes. That's good. Phew. The things that we struggle with. Incredible. But in, in my journey, I found the average audience that I've addressed in North America in three years is sick. Christians, sick Christians. And I predicted every conference how many were sick in numbers and the numbers of diseases, and I was never wrong one time. I can go to your church in your city, walk in on a Sunday morning, and I will tell that pastor what's in that audience and who's there and what they have, and their hands will go up, and he has a sick church. But bless God, we're dying to go to heaven in it. The average audience that I've addressed has over three to 400 different diseases and over 2,000 total because somebody has more than one disorder or disease. That's in every audience I've ever addressed. It's in this audience too. In this audience, there'll be over, over 400 different diseases and disorders and syndromes and over 2,000 in this room. This should not be. Healing is to be the children's bread. What happened to the children's bread? We're not eating bread, that's why. We're not eating the manna of God's word, we're eating that other stuff. Men's minds, 
fear-based, ignorance-based. They call it medical practice because everybody's still practicing. They call it health care. In fact, it's disease management. They, they bewitch you with the term health care. When in fact, all you're doing is being managed in your disorders. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. I said, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. You have um, classical depression. You know, it's dystemic disorder, which is, you know, you get all those clinical symptoms. You know what the symptoms are. I don't have to read this, do I? Persistent, sad, anxious, or empty mood. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> but my Jesus, he still loves me, doesn't he? I'm a dead man. And dead men are just happy to be alive. Once I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And my Father in Jesus' name sent the Holy Spirit to get me, to make me a son. I'm a dead man. And this dead man is happy every single day. You don't have to jumpstart me. I'm alive on the inside all the time. Because dead men are just happy to be alive. Maybe you haven't died to something to become alive. Maybe you're hanging on to death and thinking you should be living. You cannot live and hang on to the attributes of what produces death. Spiritual first, psychological and biological. Feelings of hopelessness or pessimism, no faith there. Feelings of guilt, worthlessness or helplessness. Loss of interest, decreased energy. Ah, we read all that already. Pfft. Causes. I thought this was significant. There is no single known cause of depression. Now, I'm going to get into, after our break, the four areas. And I'm going to talk about the areas that depression can come. And you'll, be, you'll, you'll, you'll find it quite interesting. Sometimes depression <clears throat> or feelings of depression can be caused by what you eat. Producing a chemical imbalance in your body. Basic, basic flatline definition of depression. The result of a chemical imbalance in the body. That is one of the main definitions of depression. The result of a chemical imbalance in the body. I'll give you something to talk about at your break here. When somebody comes to me with low-grade depression, well, they're not depressed. They're just like, you know, not on top of their game. They, they just, you know, okay, all right, but just, uh, 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 uh. The first thing I ask them is this. Are you on artificial sweeteners? Many people are on artificial sweeteners because of fear. Now, there are diabetics that, and that when I'm talking about, you know, the result of, but most people that are on artificial sweeteners aren't diabetic. They're fear-based because they don't want to gain weight. The number one product that causes weight gain and reduce caloric burn is artificial sweeteners. The number one product that ignites caloric burn and produces weight loss is natural sugar. You've been had. The villain absolutely is laughing his head off at your fear-based thinking. So what I do, I tell people, I said, do me a favor. Come off artificial sweeteners for 30 days. Because it's going to take 30 days for your bodies to reacclimate to your biochemistry. It's not going to happen overnight. But come back in 30 days and tell me, 
do you feel a little more up about life? Most of them do. Most of them do. Hi. Got to say one more thing. <laughs> Many people come here from all over the world. Over 40,000 people have come to this town, to this building, from all over the world seeking help for their life in the past 20 years. We have a program called For My Life and Walkout Workshop. We just finished For My Life this week. We just finished uh, a clinical study of the results of the For My Life program in the areas of anxiety disorders and depression disorders. It was professionally done. The results were astounding. I heard the other day that it was even more than what I say is good. I heard as high as 90%. I said, oh, I don't better not say that. People won't believe it. But maybe they'll believe 75%. That in the, in the study of people that came through our program for my life and tracking them for two years as to their condition, the statistics for those with anxiety disorders were this, 75% healing and freedom without recidivism for two years. In the area of depression and depressive disorders, the results is almost the same. 75% success without recidivism for a period of two years. Folks, this is unheard of anywhere in the world. No drugs were given. No modalities of manipulation. Basic truth applied, God honored, and the cloud lifted. I offer you that as a possibility. Do you know how many people that I have helped that would just weep? And I would just weep with them mm -hmm. until we were both spent. Mm -hmm. Neither one of us were the same person ever again. Amen. I never knew all of this stuff. So I've got a new life and I got a new relationship with my father. And that fills that that emptiness inside of me that I could never, I was looking for things to fill it and could never find it. I got healed from scoliosis and I've had it since I was like 12. Van Health healed me from ADD. I've been able to open up and make more friends than I had before. Well, For My Life is one week of looking at your life and looking at your thoughts and looking at what is in your background, what's in your family history, and looking at why you've got problems in your life or why you've had illnesses. So it actually is a way of thinking about disease from a, a biblical or a spiritual perspective. And that allows you then to think, is your life actually in line with the Bible or is it actually totally out of line with what the Bible teaches? It's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful cabin experience, you know, <laughs> and you get to hang out with really cool people. It's really neat to meet people from all over the U.S. and even from other countries here. The staff. The staff is amazing. And being is really, the oh my staff goodness. Is amazing. You know, it started from on the phone, you know, mm -hmm. very engaging people, mm -hmm. and then to come and meet them in person and the way, you know, they take their time. They talk do. with you, you know, and um, give you their shoulder if you need to cry questions. on their shoulder. Yes. These people are so caring. There's no judgment. I have experienced love, compassion, acceptance of Christ through each and every one. All my life is life changing. Life changing. It's life changing. It's a change that other people can see. Take time out for your life. Don't miss the opportunity.
Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Back to back for my life. Mm. <laughs> <laughs>
give the enemy any foothold in our thinking and that we choose to believe God. And, you know, I like to tell people, look, this is not a one and done. If Satan told Jesus in the wilderness, uh, I'm going to wait for a more opportune time. He certainly is going to wait for opportune times for us. So we just be on alert and we say, who told me that? Every time that thought comes, it's going to take me back to allowing my body to succumb to a disease. I'm like, mm, no, you're out of here in the name of Jesus. I don't listen to you anymore. If somebody was on the fence about coming to For My Life, I would say, do you really want to be well? That's what Yeshua had asked people sometimes. Do you really want to be well? Then we have to take responsibility for our own choices, our own thoughts. Who are we going to agree with? Who are we not going to agree with? And we have to apply God's Word to our life and stop expecting God to do it for us without our part. Thank you for your, your big hearts. Uh, I don't want to appear insensitive to the depth of what depression can take a person. Do not think that I'm being flippant about the condition. But I'm also uh, not insensitive to not having it and defeating it. So there has to be some tools that you have. And uh, I know when a person's in depression, uh, the last thing they want to hear is something positive. Because they will think you're insensitive. And it's not, folks, I want to tell you, this is not mind over matter. When I say take ownership of your life, that is not mind over matter. There's a battle for you, period. Every day. There's a kingdom assigned to you to interfere with your journey of uh, sanity and peace and health. So what? Embrace the concept and plan on being an overcomer. Plan on being an overcomer. There is a narrow gate that leads to life. Few there be that find it. That narrow gate is not out here somewhere that you go chase it down. The narrow gate is right in the midst of the wide gate. And there are many voices in the wide gate asking you to deviate from the principles that will take you into eternal life. I want you to enjoy that time when Jesus said, If you'll overcome as I overcame, as I have sat down with my Father, so if you overcome, you will just sit down with me and my Father. I want that for all of you. To he that overcomes shall inherit all things. Somebody said, well, this is so hard. Can I give you a reality check? I don't mean to be insensitive in saying this. But I don't care what you're going through. A hundred, no, don't, I didn't finish my sentence. <laughs> Relax. I do care what you're going through. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, that come off wrong. Can I finish my sentence? <laughs> um, I don't care what you're going through, anything that you're going through or will ever go through here on this planet. I'll give you a prophetic statement. A hundred years from now, it'll be the last thing on your mind. So stop making it so eternal now. I mean, that ought to help you. It. You know, you say, well, I, uh, let's relax. There's hope. And so from psychology today in this article, it says there is no single cause for depression. Rather, it is likely results from a combination, and I want you to track with me now, genetic. Now, I took you, if you could bring that chart back up again, please, of that X chromosome. Right here in medical science, they see down here in this X chromosome, down here in section 28, right down here, 
that what causes inherited manic depression, illness, X-linked, recessive gene to the mother, always appears in this chromosome. It doesn't appear in any of the other ones. It is consistent. Now, God did not create the X chromosome defective. Now, this X chromosome is a carrier for many other problems. You can look down through the list over here, and, and if you can pronounce these words, you're better off than I am. And so, I just want you to, to take a look that God did not create mankind. This is taken from a chart showing over 1,000 different disorders and diseases that are genetically inherited that man has identified in biology and science and all the rest of it. Over a thousand genetically inherited maladies. God did not create mankind defective. God did not create man diseased or insane. But something joined mankind that made him diseased and allowed him to have some bats in his belfry tower and cause confusion and double-mindedness and, and all these feelings that, that come. Something I talked about that in the first session. So genetic is a factor. Biochemical. Now, I just did discuss artificial sweeteners is one of the main causes of low-grade low depression. I have some really, I've been doing some research recently on why, why is dementia increasing at 400% per year? And I've had some sneaking suspicions about neurological degeneration. I've been doing a little research about what causes neurological degeneration, some of it spiritual, but some of it is chemical. Some of the research that I'm reading, there is some strong evidence that artificial sweeteners are producing neurodegeneration. And that could be the reason why we have neurological pathways that are damaged producing dementia. Now, Alzheimer's is a different story. That's autoimmune disorder. The other one isn't. They don't know what causes it. But somehow the pathways of memory aren't working. In the case of Alzheimer's, the immune systems are producing peptides or a plaque that builds up on the neurological uh, memory pathways of recall. And the thought, a person that has uh, Alzheimer's hasn't lost their memory, it's still there. But the thought can't get through because it bumps into these plaques or peptides that are formed by the immune system. And it can't get through if the person cannot have the cognition or the remembrance. The other one is quite serious. So I challenge you in your thinking. I, there's a lot of natural products out there that you don't have to use artificially created products for sweeteners. There's all, they're all over the place. And they're natural and they're safe. I would certainly change my lifestyle to save my mind. A word to the wise right now, folks. We've had to make some changes in our lives to deal with a world that's insane. GMOs aren't much different. There are 45 industrialized nations that are listed in the top list of 45 industrialized nations. America is the one and only nation of the top 45 that has not made GMOs illegal. The collusion between industry and government is a major plague, producing a biological disease genocide of its own people from within. I will not retract that statement. Interestingly enough, and this is a scientific research, that of these 45 nations, America, which spends 12% of its national gross product trying to stay alive, more than any nation in the world, has slipped to number 45 in terms of longevity. We're now number 45 of the top industrialized nations of the world that are living less long. This may come as a shock to you, additional research. The number one nation in the whole world with the highest level of psychiatric problems is the United States of America, 
with one-third of its people on some type of psychiatric medicine. America. These are serious times. This teaching probably is quite prophetic for you. To help you come awake. That you don't have to be a victim of ignorance. Say, well, I don't know. I don't like the word ignorance. Well, the Bible uses that term. It says that God's people are full of ignorance. What it says is really this. There's a, the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction or death. So because you're following instinct doesn't mean it's knowledge or wisdom. And right now, America is filled with superstition. Living by instinct based on past wrong conclusions. And the newer ones aren't any better. America is no longer a Christian nation, folks. Pray for America, for revival. Now, so much for that little PSA. Other is environmental issues can cause depression. Other psychological factors. They use the term psychological factors, but nowhere's in psychology. And not one time in the, the new, it used to be DSM-4, now it's the DSM-5. Not one time in all of psychiatry, including Christian psychiatry, is the realm of the human spirit even considered a factor in prevention and healing. It's all psych. It's all soul. You might need, not need more counseling. You might need just to get rid of a devil that's talking to you and tell it to shut up. You're not going to be influenced anymore and tell it to go to its dry place that you can think straight. But the church isn't being taught you have an enemy. The new grace mistake teaching say you don't have an enemy. You can live like hell and you're loved and going to heaven and grace covers you. The church is sick. And no one dares say it is. I say it is. But it is not God's will that it be sick. We ought to be the light of the world. We ought to be the shining light of God's mercy and his great and his power and his health and his sanity, not just the opposite. Well, I'll finish preaching. Parts of the brain responsible for regulating mood, thinking, sleep, appetite, and behavior can be affected. In addition, important neurotransmitters, chemicals that brain cells use to communicate, appear to be out of balance. Some types of depression seem to run in families, suggesting a genetic link. However, depression can occur in people without family histories as well. Let's skip through some of this because I think uh, we'll just move through some of this research. You can go online if you want to be a clinician and get all the facts, but no solutions, you can find it. I'm serious. The only solution they have is antidepressants. Treatments. I was going to read this certain medications used for depression, as well as some medical conditions such as viral infections or a thyroid disorder, can cause the same symptoms as depression. So you need to be careful that the depression isn't a side effect of another biological malady. It can be, it could be. If a physical cause for depression is ruled out, a psychological evaluation that includes a mental status exam should be done. It's all psychological. Antidepressants work to try and normalize naturally occurring brain chemicals now called neurotransmitters, notably, notably serotonin and norepinephrine. Other antidepressants work on the neurotransmitter dopamine. 
These are the three major neurotransmitters that are problematic in most psychiatric disorders. These three. All the enemy has to do is manipulate your biochemistry, and he does it through the influence of thought. You're so easy. Just give you a thought, let you believe it's really you. Let you take ownership. Your body will conform. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Then you have your serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That's the SSRIs including Prozac. People who take Prozac are because they have a depression state. I want to talk a little bit about that a little later on how does Prozac work. Prozac does not increase serotonin. Serotonin release can only be increased by a person feeling good about themselves, period. Let's talk about Prozac for a minute. When we talk about Prozac, Prozac, the pharmacological action of Prozac is simply this. Prozac chemically blocks, shuts down the return ports for serotonin that's floating in synapse at the end of the dendrites to keep it from going back in and being restriculated, which would be normal. Because there's not enough serotonin, the pharmacist has learned that he can give a drug such as Prozac that will block, actually causes the return ports to close, thus leaving more serotonin in circulation, trying to give the increase of feel-good. But serotonin levels have not been increased whatsoever. You got a guy that doesn't feel good about himself. You know, he's not on top of his game. Nobody loves him. So he goes to the doctor and he's kind of like low grade depression, kind of, yeah, kind of blase, melancholy, blase. And the doctor says, Oh, I got, I'll give you some Prozac. Uh, Prozac is an upper. It works the same thing as, let me see. It, it's pharmacological action is quite similar to the drug ecstasy. Similar, I said, to the illegal drug ecstasy. It's an upper. So the guy takes the Prozac. Takes about ninety days for it to get its bio, its chemical. In fact, you can get Prozac for free for the first thirty days from any doctor. They're going to do it for free to condition you to receive more. Prozac has some serious side effects. First of all, the, the man, say it's a man and he's on Prozac, and he gets into his, into his chemistry of his body. The first side effects of Prozac is to cause an anxiety disorder. Well, you've dealt with the feelings of depression, but now you're kind of looking around what's going to go wrong. Now you have to take a drug, an anti-anxiety drug, to balance out. Now you're feeling better about yourself, but now you're looking around like, what? Well, we can become paranoia. Oh, yeah. The next major, these are major side effects. There's about two dozen. The next major side effect of Prozac is loss of libido or sex drive. You got a guy not feeling good about himself. Now he's got an anxiety disorder. He's married. But he loses all interest in his wife. You think he had problems to begin with? You ladies expect to be pursued properly by your husbands. You need to expect it. That's your faith. And they need to step to the plate and satisfy that God-given requirement. If he loses all interest in his wife, he's about to live on the roof alone by himself. Because it's not going to be peace in that home. 
The next third major side effect of Prozac is psychotics. You can do your own research if you like. Every mass murder in America for the past 30 years, including Columbine, post offices, every mass murder in America, the person who perpetuated it has been on Prozac. Every single one were on Prozac. Because one of the major side effects of Prozac is psychotics, antisocial behavior. I think God had something different in mind to help us with our battle with ourselves about ourselves. You're required to accept yourself by God. Why? Because he has accepted you. Who is greater, you or God? Are you sure? Then if God is greater than you and he has accepted you through his son, and you who are lesser than God don't accept yourself, you're overthrowing God's covering in your life. And actually you enter into something called self-idolatry. You've made an idol of yourself. So God, he doesn't even care what he thinks. You're no good. Everybody knows it. He made a mistake in saving you. You're a worm. You're no good. And you're actually calling God a liar. I'm not interested in calling God a liar because he's truth. You cannot call truth a liar. You call lies a lie. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should lie. He is truth. He's sanity. God is sanity. God has no depression. God has no anxiety. Side effects. Side effects of antidepressants can be mild, sometimes referred to as adverse effects. They can be annoying. Can include dry mouth, constipation, bladder problems, sexual problems, blurred vision, dizziness, drowsiness. That's not good. The most si common side effects with the SSRIs, the serotonin reuptakes, are headaches, nausea, nervousness and insomnia, agitation, feeling jittery, and sexual problems. How do you begin to deal with this? Take ownership of your life. How do you move? Say, well, I, I, I want to go from black to white. You may not come out of depression because I taught this. You may not come out of depression just because you say I have enough faith to defeat it. Because your mind has been trained to think this way. Your persona or your personality those thoughts aren't just temptation anymore. Those thoughts aren't just an enemy trying to influence you. Those thoughts, listen carefully, are actually part of your biology. Your enemy knows exactly how to train you in the law of sin. Exactly. Let me tell you a little, a little information about short-term memory and long-term memory. Because if you begin to understand what I'm saying in this conference, you might have some tools to recover yourself or prevent it to begin with. Maybe. All of you looking at me here, I'm teaching you, yes, hi, I'm, here I am. Right now, it's short-term memory. Could we bring up the spirit, soul, body chart number one? Here you are. You're a spirit. You have a soul, and you live in a body. The soul is the bridge between the physical world and the spirit world. Psychiatrists do not acknowledge you're a spirit being.
you're perceiving me through one or more of your five physical senses right now. Two of them in particular, sight and sound. The images that you're taking in today are being recorded at the soul level in your cerebral cortex because of beta brainwave activity. Beta. Over in England and South Africa, it's beta. That's a fish. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, either one pronunciation is correct. You can say uh, theta or theta or theta. You can say beta, beta. They're all spelled the same. Get the spelling right. You'll be happy. Without this brainwave, you would not hear me or see me. You'd be a vegetable. Now, you might be able to smell, taste, and touch. So the only way I could teach you is through touch, taste, and smell. And later today, that won't be a good meal. So God has created you. This is very basic, folks. This is basic spirituality and biology. You've heard of the mind-body connection? Everybody has, but nobody pays attention to it. But no one really is teaching spirit-soul-body connection. Because nobody, and here's the problem with science, and you're stuck with it. You're stuck. And I have no problem with, with man looking at what God created, and I'm indebted to science to be able to see what I see. So don't think I'm against science. All that science is is the evidence of what God created, and I'm happy to know more. So I'm not an enemy of science. I'm an enemy of hypotheses and wrong conclusions. I'm an enemy of superstition and anyone that does not validate the spirit world, including God and us in it. That's tunnel vision and ignorance at the highest level. So you're perceiving me through beta. You're recording what you see and hear right here at the cerebral cortex. Right now, you are. And it's short-term memory. Well, if you begin to meditate on something. Now, here's what, here's what they, they tell me. You have had to heard something or seen something in its entirety six times just to retain 25% of what was said or seen. We're all a little slow, aren't we? Now, the enemy comes along, and he doesn't give you thoughts just six times. He may give you those thoughts every day for 365 days because he wants to program you into a depressive disorder. You're in his sight because you don't understand. You're, you're, you are ignorant of Satan's devices because you, even science hasn't told you. And here's the fallacy of science. It only believes what it can see. That's why science hates the Bible, because it makes them look at things they cannot see, and they go tilt. But you're told that you don't judge things by just what you see. Jesus said he didn't judge things by what he just saw, because he had the Spirit of God working with him also to discern things well beyond. He even knew the thoughts of their hearts. Invisible thoughts, he would understand them. I, it was his faculty as the work of the Holy Spirit. But if you begin to think and meditate on things over and over again, there is a biological phenomena happens called protein synthesis involving an element of RNA, DNA, specifically RNA, that if you begin to meditate on what you've seen or heard over and over again repetitiously, that thought, which was short-term memory, now through the process of protein synthesis, synthesis, hard to say it real fast, that thought becomes permanently, listen folks, permanently part of your biology. And that word of sin has become flesh to your flesh. 
But you're to allow the Word of God to become flesh to your flesh. You're to meditate on the Word of God. How often? How often? How often? Because God knows that if you begin to meditate on God's Word day and night, that the Word of God will become permanently part of your biology also. And now you have an antidote to the law of sin. But if you don't have an antidote to the law of sin, all you have is a law of sin and no other thoughts to defeat it. And you can go to the antidepressant, but it doesn't help you change your mind. In fact, the antidepressant will keep you from dealing with the issues of your life. That's why I said coming out of these persona profiles is not that easy. Because you have to retrain your minds. And the process of coming out of it is that as you put in the God's word, which is life and which is truth, which is the opposite of what the law of sin has come to you by that other kingdom to influence you and tempt you. Now, as Paul said this in Romans 7, he said, in my members, in my members, here's your members right here. In my members, I have two laws. In my members, I have two laws. Read it. It's right there in Romans 7. I have the law of God, and I have the law of sin. So don't you. You still can remember how not to forgive someone. But the Word of God says you're to forgive your brother. How often? Seven times seven? No, Jesus said to Peter, 70 times seven, Peter. And even though we know we're to forgive our brother 70 times seven, because the law of sin is so strong in our members, we go to unforgiveness, bitterness, pain, repaying evil with evil, and all of a sudden we establish another kingdom, and no wonder the Spirit of God is not there to protect us. Because God does not honor the law of sin. He only honors the law of God. And if you don't have the law of God, you don't have a chance. You can be a Christian all you want. Without God's word, you're easy pickings. Because you have nothing to compare to. You have nothing to compare to. Second Corinthians 10.5. I'm skipping through my teachings trying to bring things into focus because i got a lot to say. No time to get there. But we're going to get there. Because I want to leave you an impartation, not just the facts. I can give you so much facts, you'll fall asleep. But what good is it to give you facts and you don't want to do with it? Oh, I can break down all the, you know, DSM-5 definitions of melancholy and and bipolar and unipolar and, and all the rest of this stuff, and I can go into all the clinical stuff and all that, and by that time we'll all be off our chairs sleeping on the floor. And you walk out of here with a knowledge about a disease, but you didn't learn how it got there and how to defeat it. I would be derelict in my calling if I didn't show you how to prevent it and how to be free of it. And I'm not selling any medications today. I have no special therapies to offer you. You don't need counseling for 30 years. You need revelation from the truth. A lot of people making money off your inability to take ownership of your life. A lot of people love to manage you. It's good business. At least you have somebody to dump on. It's therapeutic, by the way. Well, the Bible says confess your faults one to another, but then it says that you may be healed. So what good is it to confess your faults one to another and you're never healed? There is a place of confession one to another. There is a place for people to bear each other's burdens. And thank God for those that are laying their life down to help people think straight. But I have to tell you something. 
I've been unable to help one human in 30 years of ministry that wouldn't take ownership of their own life. Why? Because they had no faith. And says, so that faith is impossible to please God. God's going up there and said, well, I can't help you either. I mean, you can down here and mulligar up and have breakfast, dinner with the enemy. And, oh, yes, you got a diagnosis. And now you can tell your friends uh, just how, you know, on all, you, you're an expert now in, in drugs. And you're an expert now in disease. And, and yes, you, you ought to start a medical school. I was a pre-med student when I was young. Dropped out to be a DJ. If I'd gone into medicine, I couldn't help nobody. So I was a dropout. I was a prodigal son, 38 when I got saved. When I came back into the kingdom, I began to understand principles beyond science. And today I find myself an expert worldwide in my field, and I'm on the cutting edge of psychiatry and science worldwide. And how did I get here? Because of the Word. Because of the Word of God. If you want to defeat, defeat depression, begin to read Psalms. Take a chapter a day, and by the end of that book, depression won't stand a chance in your life. And don't use the Psalms as a placebo. Use it as life. Use it as truth. And take a lesson from David, who was a man after God's own heart. And yes, he did struggle with his enemies, depression, disease, and yet he was more than a conqueror. Take a lesson from King David. I want to be a man after God's own heart. Do you want to be a man and a woman after God's own heart? I do. Why not? I want to be a man after the devil's own heart. Yuck. 2 Corinthians 10.5. Holding every thought captive. What's holding every thought captive? Taking ownership. That means every thought you have, every feeling, every emotion, every picture, everything that surges through your consciousness, even feelings, even apprehensions, even because those feelings and apprehensions and thoughts can cause biological manifestation to prove you've got a problem. You're so easy. You're so easy for the enemy to manipulate in disease profiles. You're a great disciple of error. But you're not to be disciples of error. You're to be disciples of truth. And how do you defeat error? And how does... Error defeat truth. Gets people to listen to error. You, many of you know the Word of God, and you can make sure everybody else around you knows that you do. But you don't want to have to live by it like you need to. Oh, we can use the Word of God to show the spots and blemishes and the little, little specks in other people, but what about the beam in our own eye? So God doesn't want you to become so educated that you don't embrace it for yourself. You need to embrace truth for you and you alone first. I see so many people trying to help people in ministries while they themselves were castaways and derelict in truth. You know what Paul said? What, what purpose is if I bring all this revelation that God has given me and I bring all this knowledge for mankind and I myself be a castaway? Benefit is that. Be selfish. Eat first the good manna. Come on now, I'm talking to you. I'm being a life coach. Today, I'm being a life coach. I'm not trying to preach you a sermon. I'm not a preacher. I'm an irritator and an agitator. Because God uses me to compel people to think about things that they wish I wouldn't talk about. 
because we're so happy in our prison houses. It's like a prisoner. They say you take a prisoner, release him to probation, put him back in society. He'll commit a crime to get back where it's safe because he can't stand being free. I see many people, Christians included, cannot stand being free. They just can't stand it. They'd have nothing to talk about. I want to tell you about my freedom. Second Corinthians ten five. Holding every thought captive, casting down every imagination. Let's go over and read it. I paraphrase a lot of scripture. Sometimes it gets me in trouble. So this one I feel like prompting. I just need to read it. Rather than just giving my Henry version. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So when thoughts come to you that you're not loved, hold that thought. Where did it come from? Now I want to talk about the origin of thoughts with you. May I do that? Thoughts can originate in your own mind. You can decide to buy a lie that comes to your own mind all by yourself. Because you have an active brain in there that there's thoughts popping all over the place, feelings, emotions. That's a depository. And everything that you are is recorded in deductive reasoning because of alpha brainwave activity at the cerebral cortex level. So the alpha way allows, alpha waves allows you to assimilate, tabulate, condense, to bring into deductive reasoning the things that you perceive externally through beta and the things that you perceive internally through theta brainwave activity. This is an exact science, folks. You only have three brainwaves that keep you ticking upstairs. The theta brainwave is four and a half to seven beats per second. If you didn't have beta brainwave, you'd be a vegetable. If you didn't have theta, you couldn't hear God. You couldn't hear the Holy Spirit. And the only way that you could experience the Holy Spirit in truth as a witness of the Holy Spirit is that God would have to materialize in the physical dimension and communicate with you through your five physical senses for you to comprehend anything. But God's not going to appear in a physical dimension because he's a spirit. He will communicate with you spirit to spirit. I said God communicates with you spirit to spirit. And what you take in through the Word of God here, the Holy Spirit here at this level bears witness of truth. You embrace it so that spiritually and psychologically you become one with truth. So you're not double-minded anymore. You understand forgiveness both as a spirit being and also as a psychological human being. You're one. In conclusion, that's what God wants, for you to think the same at the spirit man level and at the soul level. And that way, if you do, anything that speaks to you here that would be against what the Holy Spirit has borne witness here, you're going to cast down. Anything that would try to influence you from the spirit world, you're going to cast down too because you have both door points, both gates awake. The things that speak to you externally and things that speak to you internally, you are on duty, you're awake, you've taken ownership, and you're studying every thought, every emotion, and saying, where'd that come from? That's not my heart. That's not who I am. But the church has not been taught how to take ownership of its life. It's just using Jesus as a placebo. 
Well, if Jesus wants me to change, he'll just have to do it against my will. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what is said in the word. Choose this day what you shall have. You choose this day what you shall have, life or death. Blessings or blanks. Who's going to choose? See, what it says over here in the choice in the sixth verse, and having a readiness to avenge, revenge all disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled. That's taking ownership. I'm going to defeat things that represent disobedience, but I can't defeat disobedience and I practice disobedience. I can only defeat things that are not of God if I obey things that are of God. Are you tracking with me? I'm awake. I'm awake every day. The thoughts that come through me aren't always good. So what? Well, I just wish I wouldn't have these negative bad thoughts that come. Flush it. So you're, you're not immune to temptation. You're not immune to the influence of a spirit world that wants to get you to listen. Wake up. You've been listening. I decide what I will embrace as truth. I decide what is not truth. I decide that if I have a feeling of rejection, I'm not rejection. And if that feeling of rejection can be removed, I get to stay without the feelings of rejection. That is your birthright. Because you have a feeling means nothing. Now, it's good to have good feelings. Don't think I want you to be androids. It's wonderful to have deep emotions and deep feelings, but the good kind, the positive kind, to have empathy, to have love and forgiveness and patience and long-suffering. It's good, and God wants you to be that correct human being that he saw. And there's forces that don't want you to be what God saw. Go to that next chart, please. It's probably hard to see, but we'll give it a shot. Well, if you weren't a spirit being, you'd be what? Just an animal. And that's really how they're treating you as a biological specimen. Your spirit is inside you. That's the real you. You are a spirit being. God is a spirit, and he is the father of what? All spirits. And those who worship him must worship the father in spirit and in lies. And in what? And the word says, let God be true and every man a liar. That's in, your, that's in the ancient writings called your Bible. I've been using the term ancient writings lately because when I use the word Bible, people go, oh, yeah, okay. When I say ancient writings, they go, oh, this is good. I'm serious. I got them. So lately, I don't use the word Bible. I'm saying in the ancient writings, it says this, and everybody's so happy to hear esoteric truth. Come on now. We're that. We are... We are glazed to truth in something called the Bible. We, it's a dust collector on the shelf. Or a roach haven. In the glue of the pages. What are you all blinking at me for? I want you to defeat the thoughts that are causing your biochemistry imbalance. Before I leave this building for lunch, I want you to begin the journey of defeating what's causing biochemistry imbalance. Because all that depression is, 
for the most part, is a result of biochemistry imbalance. Because every drug that's prescribed by psychiatrists to deal with it is dealing with a neurotransmitter that is either over-secreting or under-secreting the neurotransmitter. That's the pharmacology of all psychiatric medicine. They say there's an imbalance. We got a drug that can cause a balance. That's why in Galatians 5, pharmacia is called a work of the flesh. It's called witchcraft, which is pharmaceutical. Why is pharmaceutical called a work of the flesh? Because it doesn't allow you, if you, now, I, I'm not against a bridge. I'm not against people taking a medication to help bridge them until they can get sanctified. I had this saying, keep the sinners alive long enough that I can get them sanctified. Because the ultimate goal is that you don't need the medication. Now, God, we're, God's full of grace and mercy, so we're, we, we want to make sure that you don't think that I'm telling you to get off your medication. Not even. But I tell you this, that if the need for the medication is rooted in not holding your thought captive, embracing these thoughts and things that are anti-Christ in nature, anti-God in nature, causing a biochemistry imbalance, the medication will manage you with some relief. That's a halfway house. Medications do not produce cure. I said medications do not produce cure. They're part, of the, they're part of the application of a halfway house. And most of the medical profession is running a halfway house between life and death. Trying to keep people going, and they consider that God's perfect will. Now, God's perfect will is not to keep you going and be managed. God's perfect will is you don't have a problem at all. It's God's, not God's perfect will to heal you. Biblically, theologically, God's perfect will is that you don't get sick at all. And if you're sick, you need to know why. Diagnosis is important to me because I can't see inside the body, you know. But then when I look and see the diagnosis, then I know what thoughts people have that's causing the problem. I'm very knowledgeable in over a thousand different diseases and disorders that when somebody gives me the name of the uh, syndrome or the disease, I know why they have it. I know the etiology. I know the thoughts and the spirituality and the personality that has caused that body to conform to the image of death, not life. Or disease, not ease. And all that this problem is, is first the problem is a dis-ease, if not dealt with, becomes a diagnosed disease or syndrome. So can we go over here where it's just dis-ease and deal with it before it goes to disease? Science and the church has no idea what I'm talking about. I'm not being critical. This is my field, and I'm an elder in the Christian church for, th for 30 years, and I have a right to speak into my industry any time I feel like it. And I will, and I do, because God loves you. And he does not want to share you with a villain. The gospel offers you more than cohabitation in a halfway house with a villain, and call that freedom. He who the sun sets free is free Indeed. Could we hold out for that as a possibility? So in this, in this issue right here, your thoughts can come from your, your own head. Your thoughts also can come from others who influence you. Fear can be contagious. Gossip can be contagious. It's murder. Accusation can be contagious. It's murder. Speaking evil of your brother is murder according to Scripture. 
Did we not read the word for our own sanity and our own safety? Did we not read the word? You can be influenced here by people around you. And then how they've influenced you to think, speak, and act is transferred into your soul. And you now have a fixation of persona, of personality. But over here, here you are, right? Here you are. But over here, the Holy Spirit wants to influence you. And the Holy Spirit only influences you by undergirding the Word of God. God watches over His Word to perform it. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Truth. But the enemy down here, that kingdom of Ephesians chapter 6, that Satan oversees in a bureaucracy, they want to influence you too. Paul said this in Romans 7, I want to do good, but I don't do it. And the good that I wish I would do, I don't do it, and the evil that I wish I would not do, that's what I do. Then Paul said, in the day that I do this evil that I wish, this is Romans 7, folks. In the day that I do this evil that I wish I would not do, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. What he's saying is that I have been influenced by sin that lives within to get me to think, speak, and act different than what God intended. And even though I know God's word, and yes, bless God, I say amen to it, there's another war in my members that's warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Well, I thank God through Jesus Christ there's possibilities for freedom. From, I can say, from that last day forward, I, when I wake up in the morning, I don't have the heaviness that I had before. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, my name is Monica Martin, and I am from uh, Kinzers, Pennsylvania. I found out about the program through, uh, or the Ministry of Being Health through um, a friend um, who I just mentioned Dr. Wright's book to me uh, a couple years ago, and we were just chatting. She mentioned a more excellent way to be in health, and I just kind of stuck it somewhere in the back of my mind. And um, yeah, and as time went on, it just kept coming up in different ways. Uh, she mentioned about YouTube videos that I could get online okay. and uh, watch some be in health YouTube videos. And um, so I started to do that. Um, well, I've uh, battled depression for 30 years. Wow. Just on and off. Uh, and um, God's done some work in my life that uh, teaching me about how much He loves me. And, uh, and so there's just been growth times in that. And then there's been times that I've um, struggled again. Um, and so it's kind of been a roller coaster of a ride with uh, depression. There were times um, that I that I did have suicidal thoughts, um, and that I um, I um, sought out help through um, um, a spiritual director and um, then a psychologist and okay. some medications at one time, and then God just took me through a journey of. It really healing, I believe that I didn't, I felt that I didn't need the medications and yeah. I um, gradually came off of those and, and that went well and I felt good for a while. Um, but I just, again, then at times felt my, found myself back into periods of heaviness, I'll say. And um, I guess the most pronounced thing for me wasn't any one dramatic event. It was just waking up every morning feeling like I just didn't want to do the next day. Yeah. Um, just a heaviness. Yeah. 
So last summer, um, I just really, when I started to listen to some of the YouTube videos and, and um, explore being health, I felt God saying to me, you need to run to Georgia. <laughs> and I said, run, you know, and he said, yep, run. Um, and one of uh, a spiritual director that I have that I pray with, she said, um, I think God's going to run to meet you there. You know, yeah. he's running, he's running to meet you there. Uh, wow, just, I, I believe I was healed. Um, just during the teachings during the week, um, one of the, uh, well, a lot of the teachings were just so impactful. Things that um, I hadn't either heard before, just things that I heard, but then stuck for a while, but then didn't. And um, one of the most impactful for me was um, the Father's love. Uh, Amen. Whew, and just coming um, to realize how much my heart was broken and how much it needed to be healed. And really realizing since then, even as I learned to walk in the Father's love uh, in a very personal way, um, just realizing that uh, coming out of denial of how much hurt I really was in um, and how much work, how much hurt I've walked in for a long time. Um, and I'm just still uh, trying to understand and beginning to understand um, the lack of nurture because I had to uh, parents that loved me very much, um, but I just wasn't able to receive sometimes their love and sometimes um, they didn't know how. <laughs> they didn't know how to love me the way I needed to love, and uh, to be loved. I think the biggest thing is uh, another part of that week was at the end of the week, I had to leave a little early to, for a flight and uh, one of the ministers uh, prayed with me um, for healing, specifically a depression, and I, I do feel that I was healed. Um, I didn't feel an instantaneous healing. Just uh, as, I, as she prayed and as I understood, again, a lot of um, self-rejection. That, that was a lot of teaching that week, too, that just continues to speak to me about how I've rejected myself. Um, and bitterness and accusation yeah. and um, but just a lot of self condemnation and and as since that time I didn't like I said feel immediately different but from I can say from that last day forward I when I wake up in the morning I don't have the heaviness that I had before yeah. um, I, I don't have <laughs> I'll call it some of my friends have that extra positive life outlook, you know, and I say, yeah. I'm not there. I don't know that I'll get there. I don't think that's who God meant me to be. <laughs> and that's okay. I'm just accepting that. That's okay. But I just don't have the heaviness anymore. I just wake up and say, okay, that's another day. And I can do this. And I don't, I'm, I'm not striving to do it. I'm not trying to do it. It's just the heaviness is gone. Wow. It's never returned since last, wow. last July. I would say run to Georgia. <laughs> Thomas didn't, uh, I would just say, don't be afraid. Uh, I was very afraid to come. I was thankful my son said that he would come too. But I would just say to anybody who's feeling like that and anyone who's struggling with depression or anything, anything, just run to Georgia. <laughs> just come because like there's people here who will love you and pray for you and the things that you will learn here will change the way you think uh, and please God change the rest of our lives. <laughs> oh, I just say God loves you. <laughs> He's for you, not against you. He has, uh, you belong here on this earth because he's deemed it so. Uh, and that doesn't have anything to do with your mom or your dad, your grandparents, nobody. God, your creator has wanted you here.
And he says, you belong because I created you and put you here, and that's the reason you're here. And um, to just rest in his arms, and he'll take care of the rest. <laughs> All right, calm down. Lower that dopamine. Let's get the serotonin up. Let's get rid of fight or flight, get the norepinephrine back to normal. We might produce a chemistry balance here today and really enjoy the peace of God in our hearts. What do you think? You didn't know you could control your biochemistry, did you? Absolutely. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 10.5. You're to hold every thought captive. Casting down every imagination that would cause your serotonin levels to dip. That would cause your serotonin levels to soar. That would cause your dopamine levels to dip would cause your dopamine levels to soar. Say, is it that simple? In about 80% of all depression cases, yes. Now, we can get over here and talk about the isolated syndrome, the isolated phobia, and we'd get lost in dialogue. So can we just kind of keep it tracking here? Because I want to leave you with an impression that you'll never forget. You don't have to have depression. But if you don't play by the principles of the kingdom of God in his word, what God says about you, then you're going to listen to another kingdom reform you into some other image. Now, let's get started. Oh. Bipolar. Also known as manic depression. Now, I, I had over here, I don't think I'm going to get here if I don't get over to it. So I'm just going to go over here and skip over to some things I want to talk about. Can I do that? Thanks for letting me move ahead. I want to talk about something called mood disorders, which is what manic depression is. I want, to, I want to insert a word in your thinking. It is psychopathological. Psychopathological. Now, pathology, if you study pathology, is a study of disease. That's what, that's what a pathologist does. When I was a pre-med student, I was a, uh, a guest every weekend of a doctor in Louisville, Kentucky. I was, uh, I was a handpicked to be a, a doctor in America, handpicked. Had all the aptitude, had everything going for me. So with that, two of the... Um, Doctors that were on the board of directors at the University of Louisville Medical School were my mentors. One was a surgeon, a lady surgeon, and the other was a head pathologist for the city of Louisville, Kentucky. I'll never forget the times that I would spend time with this pathologist every other weekend and go into the catacombs of the hospital there in Louisville, into the pathology department, and look at all these organs in jars of formaldehyde. Because when they do an autopsy, they would actually take out the organ that was a reason for death. I never forget looking at cancer of the liver. It was a beautiful thing. Now, don't take me wrong. It's not beautiful to have cancer of the liver. But where the cancer was, was bright circles of blues and pinks and yellows. Like you take an artist who go in there and just put blobs of paint. 
It was startling. It was startling to say the least. And so I would like to insert the word pathology. And then we could, we could insert in the word here somatic expression. Somatic expression. What's somatic expression? Well, we're going to give you another word to write down. It's called psychogenic. Now, I'm not trying to be technical. I just want to get someplace. And you'll understand eventually. The word psychogenic means having its origin in thought. It is the foundation of the mind-body connection. Science has known for a long time that thought can produce syndromes and disease. The church doesn't really, hasn't been taught that. So we're in the dark ages. Theologically and scientifically still. Well, we ask God to help us in our ignorance. It's sad. It's very simple. What I'm teaching you in this conference is very basic, very simple, and it's not complicated. It's down to earth, which is where we should land. And be of some earthly good here. So, psychopathological are thoughts that create a biologic manifestation. Biologic manifestation. What are moods? Moods are sustained emotions. Now, they can be short-term, or if you meditate on them, they can be longer and longer and longer. And the more you meditate on that mood or that thought that produces that mood, then the chances of that thought or mood or emotion being part of your long-term memory is very possible. Because you're about to be trained to be moody. You're being trained in thought so that your body will constantly respond to your mind. Your bodies are responders. Your body does not think. All of your body systems, from uh, gastrointestinal to neurological to central nervous system and gastrointestinal, every one of your body functions, body systems that God created to keep you moving, every single one is susceptible to thought. Bring that chart up on disease chart I'll just show you how susceptible you are to thought. Let's go to the general adaptation syndrome of fear, anxiety, and stress. Let me just show you just how one stressor can control your body and produce various... Now, this is... I didn't make this up. This is coming right out of general medicine. It's what's taught in med school. But when you get your doctor, he forgets what he learned. Why? Because pharmaceutical companies do not want you to know what he learned. You might get well and not need their product. I don't know if you know this, but pharmaceutical companies control the med schools now because they have the money for research. Do you know that pharmaceutical companies are now making drugs for well people? And the drug industry for your youth, years age three and up, is an incredible market for the pharmaceutical industry because the young generation coming up have not experienced acceptance and love. They have performance and drivenness. It's all straight A's. Unless you're a defect. And we put pressure on our kids to be straight-A students. God never intended that all of mankind be white-collar. And there's no stigma to blue-collar. 
So get out of your caste system. Get out of the programming of elitism. Every body part in the body of Christ is important, even the ones you cannot see. In fact, the Bible says the uncomely parts have more value than the comely. Did you not read that in your Bible? So quit looking at yourself like you're an appendage or a dangling participle. I'm the intestine. And other people can be the head. I just, I love being the intestine. In the body of Christ, I'm the intestine. Take a good look at the intestine teaching you today. If anybody knows me over the years, and some of you do, all that I do in the body, and I know I'm an elder, I know that I'm, you know, do things I do in the government, uh, that's, that's here. But as a body part, all I do and have done since I got born again is help people process food and get rid of waste. You need a guy like me. Besides, I like being the intestine. I get to eat first and get relieved first. And if you didn't have an intestine that function, you're going to be goofy. Thank God for a functioning gastrointestinal system. Now, I know perhaps it wouldn't really thrill you to be in the front pages of that, but it's essential. God has placed those in the church as it has pleased him. Why don't you just accept it? Quit comparing yourself to others. That's enough to cause you to have depression. Besides, when you start to emulate yourself up to somebody else, you're about to emulate their incompetence. There has to be something better for you than somebody else's incompetence that's sparkling. But we, but we look at others and compare ourselves to others, and actually, he's the one that created you, and he's the one that saved you, and I want to just relax in it. Just relax. The moods are sustained emotions. The effects, that's another key word, are more short-lived expressions. Now, we dip in and out of temptation. We dip in and out of feelings. We dip in and out of moods that come, feelings. And even though that may have perhaps some latent ability to create biological responses, really it's not as dangerous as long-term fixation. Because if you enter into long-term fixation, you have entered into phobic fixation. And all phobias are learned behavior. Now, i got to tell you something. We're doing a conference here in the near future on, on post-traumatic stress syndrome disorder. One whole day just on that subject. Stay tuned to our website. You'd be surprised what's behind it. All phobias are learned behavior. Long-term mood profiles are also learned behavior. So don't you think if the things that make you phobic and that create depression are eventually because of learned behavior, don't you think it's possible to unlearn your behavior? That's why you, you embrace the laws of God so that laws of sin. Both laws are powerful. The Apostle Paul, born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, Apostle, bluntly states that in his members he has two laws. We pretend we don't. Because if we ever admitted something in our belfry tower wasn't right, we'd be afraid somebody wouldn't like us. 
but it's already manifesting. Everything that's not of God in a human will manifest sometime in their lifetime. Usually at the wrong time to do the most damage. So if that's the case, then everything that is of God should manifest at some point in our lifetime. So what is manifesting? In us, what is manifesting out of us? Out of our thoughts, out of our speech, out of our actions, which kingdom is manifesting? Depression and elation. That would be your roller coaster. Depression, elation, that would be the, in, in manic depression, that would be the, the valley and then the, whew, the high riser. So you go from the valley to grandiose. Now, sadness and joy can be part of the fabric of everyday life. But when maintained in extremes is when the problems begin. You, can, you, you know, if you stayed happy all the time, I don't know if I could stand you. Calm down. Now, I know it's okay to be happy, but not chandelier swinging. You make me nervous. Because that would be an extreme, wouldn't it? And most people that act like they're happy all the time to the extreme usually have an anxiety disorder. People that talk a lot are usually afraid of people. So, you got the extremes. Can we just find a mid-range where you don't have to, to fall into the gully and hang on the clouds every day? Can we just find a place of peace? The word is very clear that perfect peace belongs to those whose minds are fixed or stayed on the Lord. What's, who's the Lord? The word. Perfect peace. If you don't know the word of God, you're going to have no peace. You don't have any resources to maintain it. It'll be, it'll be human, humanistic. It'll be psychic. It'll be emulation of others. It'll be fabricated. And we have enough fabricated personalities already. Please, flush it. Just be you. Maybe you don't know who you are. That's sad. You know how many people I talk to don't know who they are? They're in this world of, I don't know. I know they got a driver's license and they got a name, but that's about all that goes. I don't know if you ever run across people with fabricated personalities. It's yucky. Yuck. Who needs it? Bipolar is alternating episodes of depression and elation. Then you have unipolar. Now, you, have, you don't hear unipolar that often, but it involves only depression. Includes perhaps... Melancholy. Straight line. Now, here's something else. Bipolar usually begins before the age of 25. 18 to 25 is the mid-range that people start developing bipolar, as an average, bipolar personalities. Interesting enough, it's the same age pattern that people who develop paranoid schizophrenia develop in that. Now, although they do see the genetic marker in the X chromosome for manic depression bipolar, they have not isolated the genetic marker as being inherited in paranoid schizophrenia. Now, what is there between age 18 and 25 well, we'll talk about what happens as a person's coming out of puberty into, into young adulthood and how the independence gets skewed upside down from dependence to independence. Dependency 
can also be found in abusive families. It's a dependency to abuse. There are people that, that in adulthood try to find somebody that will abuse them even though they would deny that they love it. They're drawn to it because they have inherited the desire to be abused. It's classic. It's classic. I know how many females go back to abusive husband because they're codependent with him. Time and time again, getting beaten. Classic. Hypomania may be triggered by the administration of antidepressants. What are you going to do with that one? Didn't have it until you took the drug. There can be a bipolar family history. There can also be a three-generation consecutive active pedigree where every person for three straight generations has bipolar in the family tree. Again, it is inherited, recessive gene, X chromosome, recessive through the mother. The hypomania, as part of the profile, shows up at the person being driven, ambitious, and achievement oriented, but to excess. It's a fixation. Instead of growing into success, they're driven for success. God's not going to drive you to success. It may take you years to grow up into it. But the devil will try to drive you into success, and it's ungodly. Be careful of the motivation. And listen to this. Cultural, cultural, social class, and race has not been shown to impact incidents. However, sociological, social, cultural factors seem to have an impact that is somatic complaints worry, tension, and irritability are more common in the lower social economic classes. The lower social economic classes will, will suffer with somatic complaints. You might call that psychosomatic. Again, the word psycho means in the soul. Somatic means expression in physiology. You may not realize this, but 80% of all disease is psychosomatic. People don't like that because they, they think they have a problem in their head. Now, you may have a problem in your spirit, and your head just got in the way. We don't like the word psychosomatic because it bothers us. You can say we have a horrible physical disease, but don't suggest we have a problem in our heads. There's a stigma attached to it. Worry, tension, irritability. And listen to this, guilty ruminations, that would be stewing in guilt and self-reproach, are more characteristic of depression in the Anglo-Saxon cultures. I would say many of the people here in this room are Anglo-Saxon culture. That would be Germany, you know, Europe, Northern Europe, and so on. So then we would say the people who get depression in Anglo-Saxon extractions and backgrounds are prone to guilt and self-accusation and self-reproach. In some Mediterranean and African countries, as well as in American blacks, mania tends to manifest itself more often than depression. By the way, mania is a form of depression because it involves a drivenness, never satisfied, black hole, never filled. Even in looking for love in all the wrong places, a, a man can have a perfect, beautiful, gorgeous hunk of dust, and he's never satisfied. He's looking for a spare rib everywhere as he can find it. That's a form of depression. Drivenness to get a dopamine rush, a feel-good. She, notice me. I'm special. And he goes to Walmart, and his eyes are seeking out any female that can notice him. That's a depressive state. 
There's a void that needs to be filled. Come on now, you're tracking with me? Maybe you ladies have had these guys look at you in Walmart. Lord have mercy, don't you feel yucky? Psychiatric conditions at high risk for depression and anxiety disorders, schizophrenic disorders, an early phase of cortical dementias, antisocial personality, alcoholism, and other substance use disorders are found in these profiles. Heredity is the most important predisposing factor. Family trees that haven't felt loved. Inability of a male to be a proper covering as a father and a husband. Number one door point for all depression. It keeps you from accepting God the Father because he has that name Father. That's why you sent around Jesus. It's all about Jesus. No, Jesus came to show us the Father. Get over it. But the church is so Jesus-centric. They don't realize that Jesus himself said, I came to show you the Father. I don't mean to be disrespectful to the Lord. I'm not trying to be. But Jesus is not the head of the Godhead. The Father is. All good things come down with the Father of lights above, which is no variableness of turning. Jesus taught them to pray. He said, Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus said in John 16, That day you shall ask me nothing, but you shall ask the Father in my name, and he shall give to you whatsoever you ask. We don't go to God the Father because we don't think he ever smiles. Because religion has made him never un, he made him unspiling. But Jesus said this, you see me, you have seen the Father. I only think and speak like my Father. What happened to the rest of us sons and daughters? I ask a very direct question. What happened to the rest of us sons and daughters? Why do we act different than Jesus? He was a son of God, wasn't he? Was Jesus son of God? Was he son of man? Was he acquainted with sorrows and griefs? Did he die for our sins as a human? Did he have feelings? Did he blame it on his father in heaven? Did he blame it on himself? He knew who to blame, didn't he? The devil. And he knew who to glorify, didn't he? The father. Unipolar, which is straight-line depression without the, the mania, those forms are more likely to rise from a background of introversion and anxious neurotic tendencies, inversion, self-centered, self-introspective, self-accusatory. They're the enemy. It's their fault. Coupled with shame, guilt. Self-pity is the glue that holds it all together. If you have self-pity and you struggle with self-pity, you have no faith whatsoever. Because self-pity always reflects the failure of something from the past. That is your present. Let me get through some of this stuff here. <sighs> Treatments, uh, who cares? Actually, no, I just. <laughs> you guys are so much fun. There really are only about three uh, chemicals that are used to treat uh, bipolar manic depression. The one are the HCAs or TCAs. The increase of availability of norepinephrine and or serotonin by blocking the reuptake. Now, did I talk about Prozac in the earlier session? This is no different. 
people that have depression, manic depression, bipolar, always have a lowered level of serotonin. If you want your body not to produce the body chemical, if I could use that term, that gives you the feel good about yourself, then continue to put yourself down. Continue to devalue your identity. Continue to listen to accusation about your value. And through the mind-body connection, well, I was going to go over here a while ago. I didn't finish, did I? Let's, I hold that thought. I, want, I don't know if you can see this because it's probably hard to see in the back, so I'll just tell you what it says. This is two charts from the uh, GAS, General Adaptation Syndrome with Fear, Anxiety, and Stress. And we'll show you, and I'm going to use part of this chart to help you understand paranoid schizophrenia. And by the way, paranoid schizophrenia is not really a disease. Tell your shrink I said that. There is not one thing wrong with the human brain in paranoid schizophrenia. But it is what is causing the over-secretion of dopamine and norepinephrine. See, you can't read this. It's kind of hard to see, but norepinephrine, which is a fight or flight of paranoia. So all that paranoid schizophrenia is is a result of the over-secretion of two neurotransmitters. If you could stop those transmitters from being over-secreted, norepinephrine and dopamine, guess what would happen? You'd no longer have schizophrenia and the person's mind would be at peace. Can I give you a case history? I was teaching this many years ago in Minnesota about 1 John 4.18. Because what I discovered in paranoid schizophrenia develops usually between 18 and 25, follows families, the people who get it, or in families that didn't know how to love each other. Or worse, they were performance orientated. In other words, the child's value was how well he did something or she did something. And the only time the child was accepted is that they did perfect things because failure was unacceptable and it was horrible when they failed. So they ended up in fight or flight concerning the parent that put that on them. God never intended everybody to get straight A's. In my home, I've always had this rule. In fact, I helped one of my own children years ago when he was young avoid a psychiatric disease when I refused to let him be A plus orientated in competition with his friends. I just told him, you're going to be a great student, but you're not be, you may not be an A plus student, so what? Here's the deal. A, Bs, and Cs are acceptable. D's and F's are not. Do the best you can. And in releasing my son from that peer pressure and that pressure, he not only was able to come out of that psychosis that he was creating, he actually lost 20 pounds of weight because when he didn't like himself in it, rate of metabolism slowed down, calorie burn slowed down, rate of metabolism, and he was chubby, and that made him hate himself even more. So when he had a reality check from good teaching from a father, and he began to apply it and understand what I was saying, he lost 20 pounds, got out of the psychosis, and today he's a great son in, in Seattle, Washington. He's a, I call him an earth Methodist. Nurse and theticist, and whatever they call these guys, anesthesiologist. A nurse Methodist. And, then, and that's at the time that they, you know, they start about teeth has a beautiful wife and four gorgeous children, loves God, is brilliant. He was one of three people chosen when he was younger in all of America by the U.S. government to become an anesthesiologist. Uh, brilliant. Got his doctorate in being health principles. How thoughts affect your body. As was doctorate, how thoughts affect your body. Got an A in that. But... He, he was saved from a lot of problems because of proper knowledge. I had to release him from drivenness and competition. In today's world of business, it's all competition. 
In sports, it's competition. In business, it's competition. No wonder we have so many diseases. But this is how it comes. In this case of uh, paranoid schizophrenia, I was teaching from 1 John 4.18. In 1 John 4.18, there's four parts that are very important. First of all, there is no fear in love. So if you don't feel loved, guess what is coming to you? Fear produces isolation, withdrawal. You hibernate. You withdraw. You don't want to be around people. They make you afraid. They make you sweat, make you nervous, make you jerky. You develop sweats and tremors. Nervous stomach, because you're afraid somebody might reject you. So you withdraw, because you don't feel loved. You don't feel accepted. So there is no fear, no fear in love. So if you don't feel loved, fear comes. Fear has torment. There is the there is the mind issue right here. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. If you have fear, you're not going to have any power of, of action. You're not going to feel loved, and you're not going to have a sound mind. That's pretty serious, isn't it? So it has torment. This torment is part of the profile of paranoid schizophrenia, which is, I consider, not just a, a phobic disorder, but a depression disorder, because it involves withdrawal and isolation. Next part of this is that he that fears is not made perfect in love. What's that mean? If a person has this kind of fear, they're not able to give and receive love without fear themselves. How do you, get, how do you deal with it? Well, 1 John 4.18 has the antidote. Perfect love casts out fear. You want to help people that are struggling with their identity and have depressive episodes? Start loving them. I know they're hard to get along with. Who asked you to get along with people that are easy to get along with? Even the heathen can do that. Even the heathen get along with people that get along with them. And just, that's no proof of your spirituality. Well, I want to hang out with normal people. There aren't any. We all got our stuff, don't we? Some are so obvious, the rest we're in denial about, but everybody knows it's there anyway. Perfect love casts out fear. So I was teaching this in Minnesota years ago, and a man came up to me, and he said, wow. He said, I've got, uh, I've got one brother or two, I forget which, has already committed suicide. I got another brother that should be in the lockup. He's just one foot in, one foot out right now. And he has paranoid schizophrenia. The other two had paranoid schizophrenia. Are you suggesting that if I loved my brother, that the fear that caused the disorder would be driven out of him? I said, I'm not suggesting at all. That's what the word says. It says perfect love casts out fear. Well, I heard anything about him. I was in, uh, actually, I was in Garland, Texas, doing a conference about a year and a half later. And this guy showed up a year and a half later, this incredible testimony. He drove all the way from Minnesota to Texas just to give me this testimony. This is powerful, folks. He said, I decided that if the word of God was true and you were right on, Rather than avoiding my brother, which I've been doing, because how can you get along? He, he was, that didn't make any sense. So I can't hang out with him because he's out there in this weird world. 
So I decided that I'd give this a shot because I love my brother anyway, that every Saturday I would give him two to three hours of my time to find some place of communication with him. Every week I did that for one year. He said, in one year, as I began to interact with my brother, without, I didn't tell him to get it together, stop acting that way, because when you tell those people to get it together, stop acting that way, they will get worse because you're driving them right into their isolation and paranoia and avoidance. If they could stop doing it, they would. So it's not by command. It's according to knowledge. He said, as I began to spend Saturdays with my brother, he became calmer and calmer and calmer. He said, Pastor, I need to tell you what happened in a year. At the end of one year, I have a brother that is in his right mind. He's on no medications. He's engaged to be married, holds a full-time job very successfully, and is healed without medical intervention. Because he said, the Word of God is true, that perfect love casts out fear. And let me tell you about paranoid schizophrenia. Since we're talking about neurotransmitters and how susceptible that humans are to thought. Paranoid schizophrenia is a compound disorder. It involves paranoia and what's called schizo, or splitting of the human personality. Schizo, splitting. It involves the oversecretion of norepinephrine. There's norepinephrine right there. Where do you find nor norepinephrine being over-secreted is in fight or flight. The central nervous system is affected. You have fight or flight responses. So in the paranoid schizophrenia profile, the first thing comes is that this young person doesn't feel safe in their family, either because of abuse or drivenness for performance. It's a stressor. Who they are is how well they do something, or maybe they couldn't do anything right at all. Maybe there was abuse, verbal abuse. Perhaps it was emotional abuse. It, 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 there's a number of profiles of people in case histories that goes either way here. But, the, but they must escape. That creates a phobia. That's fight or flight. Biologically and chemically, in order to be sustained in that fight or flight, norepinephrine has to be released to biologically put them there. It's right here. And let's talk about dopamine. Dopamine is the pleasure neurotransmitter of the body. So what they have to do, they have to disassociate to create a safe place that's where you're not. In order to stay in that elevated, sustained state of existence, then dopamine has to be released to give them the feelings of pleasure. They think you're nuts and they're sane. There's a lot of psychotics can come with that, and it can be very dangerous for suicide or other things. And I'm not suggesting that initially putting them on site type of intervention um, from a drug may not be wisdom just to calm them down, but not to keep them on it long term. Because I have to tell you, the psychiatric drugs that, are pe that people are being given long term actually become part of their biology, and the body now demands it as normal. So to come off that, a lot of withdrawal because the body says, what are you doing? It's, I need this for me. So we have all this biochemistry fixation. And there are certain drugs that actually become part of your body, and they're very difficult to detox from it. Neurotin is one of the worst drugs on the market today. Is, I called it the new rotten drug. It's being used for everything from toothaches to indigestion. It was developed for epilepsy. It's not being used for epilepsy whatsoever. We're in trouble. Do you see one profile? So if you have someone that has paranoid schizophrenia, 
There is nothing wrong with their brain. But you have to go back and look at what took them down the journey to go in to become phobic and to isolate in that world of delusional thinking. Now, if you get into somebody that's too much in mania, because it's a repressive state, but it also involves some mania because of the uh, phobic. If you go into too much mania in that, then you're going to have the, the, what's called the voices, the hallucinatory voices that they hear. That's high-level stress disorder driven, auditor, auditory. All that's coming out of the escape mechanism. So all that mankind does is incarcerate these people, put them on drugs, and many are in mental institutions never to come out when all they needed was love to begin with. We're in the dark ages. A lot of people deal, deal with it as a demonic issue. Just cast their devils out and they'll be sane. I wish it was that easy. It's not just a devil. It is a fixation of personality. And even if you, there was an evil spirit and you cast it out, you still have the retraining of the human mind to trust. The only way you can defeat paranoid schizophrenia, that person has to trust somebody again. In this case of the, the brother, his brother that had it began to trust his brother. And as he began to trust, then he was no longer so much in fight or flight. Because he began to trust, he no longer was disassociating. And I have to tell you what happened in this case from a, from a clinical standpoint. The over-secretion of norepinephrine and the over-secretion of dopamine began to subside, subside, until his biochemistry in those two dimensions were normal. And he no longer wanted to run. He no longer wanted to disassociate. He was happy to be part of society. That's a miracle. But what I'm telling you this, there, there was an application. Even the person that was out there in paranoid schizophrenia had to open their heart. That's why perfect love casts out fear that they can open their heart. Because well past the mental and biological fixation, there is a human that lives inside called a spirit being. And there's where the Holy Spirit is. And if we look at, and if we take a look at psychiatry and the healing of people with psychiatric problems only as a clinical psychological exercise of drugs, and we don't realize that the human spirit has to be trained also from within, then you've lost the battle entirely. You've got to think about the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. The... The main uh, antidepressant that's used is the same as Prozac, you know, the HCA's antidepressants. There's the monamine oxidase inhibitors. They're not prescribed due to too much because of serious side effects, and especially in conflicting actions of the chemicals or foods. Another one that's used a lot is lithium. You'll find this interesting. Lithium, by the way, is a metal. A naturally occurring alkali metal. Now, if it's alkali, could it be? I'm just, I'm just talking out loud with you. Is it possible then in depression that the person becomes acidic? I have to tell you something I know. Anxiety will make a human acidic. A person that has their peace with others and God and themselves will have a proper alkaline foundation of biochemistry. So if you want to be acidic, then stew in your stuff. Be anxious for everything. Be phobic, and you'll find yourself possibly being a candidate for this. And listen to this. I, I, I took this right off the research. How lithium works in stabilizing the unpredictable, often explosive mood swing and behavior of bipolar people is unknown. They have no idea how it works. Because it works 
They give it. Seems to calm them down. Well, I suppose that if we could, if we could break the acidic part of a human biochemistry, you might calm down because you wouldn't be in fight or flight so much. That's just something to think about. Lithium has no effect on normal mood. Why? Because normal mood, you're not acidic. If you're normal in your moods and your personality, you're going to have a biochemistry balance where your pH value is going to be pretty good. You're not going to be too alkaline. You're not going to be too acidic. You're going to have a biochemistry balance. Isn't that what God intended? So I, I read this with kind of some interest, how this would work. It has been observed that levels of serotonin are depressed. The susceptibility of norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine to thought and how thoughts, emotions, and feelings can cause these neurotransmitters to be suppressed and or, or increase in volume. Thus, under secretion of these neurotransmitters, under secretion of these neurotransmitters can produce a wide range of physiologic responses as well as the over secretion of these neurotransmitters can produce another range of responses such as paranoid schizophrenia. You got all that, didn't you? All right. Now, I, I, I was going to skip through some of this that I don't think I really want to get into because it's just more about, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I had printed out here on the um, action of uh, norepinephrine and uh, serotonin and uh, dopamine, and I, I just think it's just too technical and really not worth the time. I think you get the picture anyway, don't you? Hopefully you do. Um, there is one thing, since bipolar is considered to be inherited, I want to talk about inherited uh, disorders and diseases. And let me see here what else I wanted to look at. Yeah, I want to go back over here too. I want to spend a little time here on inherited diseases. The word is familial. Uh, did I finish this up here? I've been kind of sidetracking myself. Um, go over to the next chart over here, the, the resistance stage. I wanted to show them something. If you go, from, go to the B chart, now that's not one. Well, you can see how that stress can affect all of your, look at here, your liver, your thyroid. Here you have hypothyroidism as a result of fear and anxiety. Go back to the disease chart, page two. And on the disease chart, page two, central nervous system. Go back to page one. Let me show you how just simple fear and anxiety can affect your physiology. Now, fear is not biology. Fear involves thought and feelings and emotions. Would you agree with that? But fear is not psychological first. Fear is a spirit that answers to Satan. We know that from one scripture, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Fear. You can find the book of Job of uh, a spirit of fear manifest and the guys here the guys are I went straight up in the air and we can get in all kinds of stories about that type of manifestation but look the cardiovascular system is affected the muscles the connective tissue pulmonary system immune system go to the next page please gastrointestinal and all the way down to central nervous system and right here you have depression can also be a byproduct of unresolved fear. If you don't feel people love you, and you have this phobia that people don't love you, that's an ingredient for depression. But it is rooted in rejection, perceived or real, and isolation and withdrawal, which requires fear to allow you to do that. So here you have, here you have the, the depression. You can take that off there now. Now, disease is broken down in two ways. True biological disease involving organic damage. For example, um, 
Let me just see if I can go down through a couple here to give you an example of what would be the difference. Um, hypothyroidism is a syndrome. Nothing wrong with your thyroid. Hyperthyroidism is a true disease in which the immune system attacks your thyroid, destroying the tissue, for example. Um, that's what's another one here. Um, diabetes 1 is a true disease in which the immune system begins to attack the body. Diabetes 2 is an anxiety disorder. There is nothing wrong with the... Um, there's nothing wrong with the body at all. So you can spin and out of these different syndromes. A disease, true disease is when the body's been impacted. But when the body is just not functioning, homeostasis is interfered with, biological function is interfered with, that should be known as a syndrome. You spell the word syndrome, S-I-N-D-R-O-M-E. Well, you know I say that with tongue in cheek. But behind a syndrome, is a thought that's not of God. So I, I say that with tongue in cheek, but it's still the truth. A thought that triggers the body not to serve the person properly, but go into disorder of function or dis-ease of function, creating something that makes the body feel like it's out of whack. That would be causing an imbalance of homeostasis, producing system disorder in function would be it. Now, the manifestation comes in two ways. First, genetic. We, we showed you some of the, the genetic code X chromosome behind uh, bipolar, manic depression. But also, here's another one that is not seen by anyone unless you know your enemy. Science does not understand this. The church is barely understanding it. Our familial spirits. What is the familial spirit? Not a familiar spirit. That would be one that would be operating in divination, such as we found in, you know, the Witch of Endor was, uh, had a familiar spirit. These are familial. What's a familial spirit? A spirit, actually an evil spirit by its fallen nature, that tracks specific families. That tracks specific families. If you go over to, mm, I think it's, uh, mm, I think it's Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, says the iniquities, it doesn't say sins, folks. It says the iniquities of the fathers shall be visited to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Verse 6 says, but to them that love me and keep my commandments, blessings to thousands. In context, is thousands of generations. We haven't even been here that long from Adam. Thousands. Listen carefully what it says. The iniquities of the fathers shall be visited. Visited. That doesn't mean automatically passed down. It means temptation will come that members of a family tree will yield to that thought, embrace it, and because of that, the enemy can produce the same syndromes and diseases generation to generation because they embrace that way of thinking that was not of God. So actually, the enemy is training a family how to become diseased. Are you tracking with me? And we're so ignorant of this process. But it's so easily understood in Scripture and also in science. Familial spirits that influence thought to produce aberrations of biological function is called the mind-body connection. In this case, we're calling it the spirit-soul-body connection because that involves the third part of you. The third part of you. That's Deuteronomy 5, 9 through 10, by the way, is what I quoted. Deuteronomy 5, 9 through 10. A genetic defect. I just had some notes I wrote down myself to help make sure I covered the territory by may just read it to you. A genetic defect may lie latent, like it was sleeping. 
until a life circumstance, especially involving conflict with others, real or perceived. Now, a lot of people believe somebody doesn't like them, not because they said or did anything, they just have a feeling that they don't like them. It's not even real. It's just perceived. But this thought will trigger the genetic defect to manifest and produce a biologic change as a result in the disease or syndrome. Let me talk about one neuropathy of the spine. This is kind of an interesting story of neuropathy of the spine called Marie Charcot tooth disease. Marie Charcot tooth disease is named after the three doctors that discovered this syndrome, Dr. Marie, Dr. Charcot, and Dr. Tooth. I'm serious. I mean, that's all that is. And they discovered something that would cause what's called the neuropathy of the spine that would produce a dying off of nerve endings at a certain part of the spine over motor control. And the result is a stiffening of the, of the muscle here in the back part of the leg and also causing a curvature of the instep or a bowing so that it produces a limp. That's Marie Charcot tooth disease. Actually, it's a syndrome. Because there's nothing wrong really here, it's what caused the nerve endings to die. Now, we deal with peripheral neuropathy, which is where the nerve endings die in the extremities and they have, there's no feeling. Anytime you have nerve endings that begin to die, the person that develops these profiles of disease has one common spiritual problem. They don't like themselves. Self-accusation, self-hatred. If you want your body to start to disintegrate, continue to put it down and put yourself down. You must love yourself. I don't mean stuck on yourself. You must accept yourself. If you don't accept yourself, your body will begin to decay because you set in motion the principles of death, not life. Because God has accepted you. He's life. Is that not true? If God who has accepted you, which is life, then he will sustain your life and your generation. But if you put yourself down and you have self-accusation, self-hatred, you're removing yourself from God's sustaining power of life because you're releasing the spirit of death and infirmity to destroy you, to convince you that you're right, that you're no good, and you need to die and move on. You set things in motion yourself, folks. Be careful. There's one kingdom wanting to bless you, and the other one wants to bless you with the opposite of God's blessings. All that disease is, is the blessing of Satan that comes on people who would rather believe a lie than believe the truth. Now, I'm telling you, just point blank, it's that simple. And in the generations, it occurs. I think we need to do some damage control, get back and start teaching God's people how to live a victorious life and not in superstition. <laughs> Being able to teach principles of life, of living, that God will honor. I was um, doing a conference in um, British Columbia years ago. It was a day of ministry, and I was teaching people how to pray for others, and I was like, you know, the coach there. And one of the team members came, and it was a large conference. There was almost 800 people at this conference. And said so there was a young lady that they were praying for had been diagnosed with Marie Charcot tooth disease. Well, I... I didn't even know, I never heard tell of it. But I carry with me usually uh, some medical manuals and a Merck manual and other things, and I can dig into all this weird stuff that people have. And so I said, well, give me a little, let me some time to look this thing up. So I, I looked up in the, in the Merck manual about the Marie Charcot tooth disease, and I found something very interesting. It is a genetic defect. It's in the gene at conception, at birth. And that gene that produces this syndrome will lay latent, not cause neuropathy of the spine, 
but can manifest in any decade of that person's life, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, any decade, but only usually will be released to manifest this neuropathy in conjunction with an emotional conflict. Now, what connection is there between emotional conflict and genetics? It's the same thing with viruses. Viruses can be activated by thought also. What's the connection between a virus and thought? Look at genital herpes. That's a good one to talk about today. The herpes virus can lay latent inside the person that has it until that person goes into a fear conflict. Maybe it's a relationship breakdown or fear, and all of a sudden they have a herpes outbreak. You know what causes a herpes outbreak? Anxiety. It is well known in psychiatric circles. That's what causes it. Now, what connection is there between a thought and a virus? What connection is there between a thought and a gene? Well, when I read this, I wondered, you know, I said, well, what kind of conflict did she have? So I said, God, this is a new one to me. Help me think. So when they came back to see if I knew anything, I said, I don't know. I want, I want to, how old is she? Well, she's about 35. I said, go ask her. And I had this incredible thought. Go ask her, did she fall in love with a young man? And he dumped her. And now she has grief. But now she blames herself because she thinks it's something in her that caused him not to like her. And now she has self-hatred, which is what would cause neuropathy. Go ask her. Well, they came back and said, boy, you nailed that one. When we asked her, she just began to cry. Yes, yeah, she fell in love with the young man, and he dumped her. And within a year, she developed a syndrome. I said, you know what you have to do, don't you? You have to go back and help her forgive that young man. She's not guilty. In fact, she was saved from a real jerk. That was God's mercy. Now, you need to tell her that. God loved you so much. The devil got stirred up in this young man. He didn't appreciate you as a gift. And God saved you from a very dangerous, unhappy relationship. And they ministered to her. Is it possible to change genetic code defect through prayer? Well, it depends if you believe in healing at all. You know, in, in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there are two. One is gift of healing. One is gift of miracles. I suppose if we were to pray for bipolar and we were to deal with some of this stuff, it would be essential to change the genetic code defect to section 28 of that X chromosome. The gift of healing is that as a work of the Holy Spirit, what's causing the malady is stopped and the body will heal. That would be the gift of healing. Gift of miracles is quite different. There are body parts that don't heal. That's why you have organ transplants. That's why you have very little evidence of brain cell regeneration or nerve regeneration. So, in the gift of miracles, it's in your Bible, by the way, and it says it's for the believers of the church age, you are supposed to be. Then what is, what is, how do you operate in the gift of miracles? And to get the miracles, you call those things that are not as if they are in Jesus' name. Expecting the Father, by his Spirit, to honor your words, and that body part that does not heal be reformed out of nothing as if it were never damaged. I've just a Henry guy, you know, and I've been trying to help God for a long time with his people. And I've seen God honor my words a few times, informing body parts out of nothing. Arms grow that needed to grow. Body parts form. I've seen stroke victims go from here to here to, at the snap of a finger when God restored the brain cells over motor control that produced the stroke. I say that not to promote what God has done through me. But I'm saying that 
that you will have heard and have faith to believe that if we're going to defeat bipolar, we're going to have to deal with the generations of unloveliness. You're going to have to recognize that it's the product of not being loved, not feeling accepted, being driven. It, it follows generations of men who did not know how to love and nurture their wives and their children. It's classic, folks. It's still here today. Do you think every man knows how to love his wife and children in the Christian church? Forget about the world. They don't know what day it is half the time. Come on, guys. Thanks for coming to the conference. I'm one of you. I wasn't always a good father or a good husband either. So I don't have any bags of stone to cast anything here. Come on. We're all a bunch of fellers in a ship here. But we can defeat generational iniquity. We can defeat gener generationally inherited genetic disorders. And we can even defeat the forces that are coming to influence us as they have trapped our families. Let me give you another example of familiar or familial spirits. This is about my son-in-law and my granddaughter. And Scott's my son-in-law, and Anna was is my granddaughter. And Scott was working with us in the ministry, and they just had Hannah and one day, Scott came to work looking like death warmed over, bleary-eyed. I was going to fall asleep talking to me. I said, What's, what happened? He said, Hannah kept us awake all night with colic. Oh, colic. Piece of cake. I said, she inherited your insecurity and fear. Because colic is a result of a spirit of fear that causes a twisting. Actually, it's a release of a signal in the central nervous system of a baby who doesn't even know how to think yet. But that spirit's there working that central nervous system of inherited fear and insecurities that's causing that intestine to twist, producing the pain of colic. I said, what you need to do is go home and command that spirit of insecurity and fear that, you, that was in you that your daughter inherited and commanded to go in Jesus' name, speak peace and freedom to your daughter, and go to bed and go to sleep. He said, you make that sound simple. I said, why complicate it? The next day, Scott came to work smiling. He said, Dad, you won't believe this. No, he said, you'll believe it. We, we did, it was so bad they put Hannah in a clothes dryer basket on the wash, on the dryer, turned it on, hoping the shaking would put the child to sleep. I said, man, you were serious, you did that. Well, I'm dead, we were desperate. And then some misguided parents, when a child has colic, will pick the child up and shake it, screaming to stop screaming. It doesn't even understand English yet. Now, you're a monster. You think the child had fear? Now it's got bunches. That's absolute Abuse. Anyway, back to my story. The next day he came to work. Right, Scott? You're right there. And I said, well, he's looking happy. He said, Dad, we did what you said. Put Hannah to bed. We went to bed and woke up the next morning and slept all night. Did she ever have colic again? How many children do you have now? Well, you had a new one. He's starting a tribe. Of the eight that you've had with Sarah, have any had colic ever? What have you done with each child when it was born? And commanded to go. And you've not had one baby yet with colic. That's how it works, folks. This is how it should work. Would you agree with that? Is it possible, do you think, 
that we could speak to the defective gene of the X chromosome if we're dealing with a life circumstance and command that gen defective gene to be changed so it doesn't release a reduction in serotonin as a byproduct. That's what that gene is doing. That gene is causing serotonin to be diminished genetically. But its profile includes thought and it's combined. Are you tracking with me? I know this is maybe complicated. Probably some of you say, what in the world? Where does this guy come from? Well, I think what I'm saying makes kind of sense, doesn't it? So, well, I, why doesn't the world know this? Because they don't have God. Why doesn't the church know this? They haven't been taught. I've been traveling in amongst the Christian church for 30 years. I haven't found many churches even care about what I teach for their people. But the people love it. So how come the people are more hungry than their leaders? Folks, there's a real dearth of God in the Christian church. We have a form of godliness. But what in the world are we doing? Healing is the children's bread. If you don't believe that God heals today, then for you, he never will. If you think healing passed away with the apostles 2,000 years ago, if you can show that to me in Scripture, I'll cut your cabbage for free for one million years. And if you say, if I minister in Jesus' name, the healing of the sick and casting out devils and cures, and I have a devil, you have committed the unpardonable sin. Be careful. Be careful. The Bible says, when the Son of Man returns to the earth, shall he find faith in the earth. I don't mean to preach at you. The home and family must be a safe place of peace in order to possibly prevent these disorders from manifesting. It seems from clinical observation that reduced levels of serotonin are found in bipolar cases. When a person does not feel safe, loved, or accepted, then the body responds by reducing the amount of serotonin. It is plausible that the genetic defect is a result of families, fathers in particular, that do not conduct themselves in a manner that provides acceptance and safety for the wives and the children. I have found this in just about every case history. I think I've learned something in 30 years of helping people. This is not an indictment. If you went to a doctor and wanted to know why you were sick, would you be offended if he told you the truth? And don't be offended if I tell you the truth. I, I love you, I care for you, and I came here that you could defeat these things. It is my observation that serotonin is usually depleted in individuals that do not feel loved and accepted. One of the things that in dealing with this and is, is the um, Israelites that came out of captivity in the decree of Cyrus to go back to uh, Jerusalem and Israel and rebuild the temple in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra. And Ezra began to read in the law of God in chapter 8 distinctly. And he began to show those that came out of captivity why their parents went into captivity why they had been there for 70 years. It was because they disobeyed the Word of God. And God had no choice but to send them into the land of the people that they loved, which didn't love God. And that's where they went. Because they didn't want God, they were taken away captive into a country that didn't love God at all. There was no word there. But when they came back and they heard the reading of the Word, in Nehemiah 9.2, we may do this at the end of the day today. Everybody just wants to be prayed for. To know the truth, the truth shall make you free. What I'm teaching is designed to give you faith, to believe. Not blind faith, but real faith. Because you're, you're using your faculties of understanding. The seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Is it possible that we could defeat this 
familial thing happening, producing genetic defect, producing bipolar. If we just came and said, we recognize, Father, in our generations, we've had fathers that weren't, didn't know how to be husbands and fathers properly. They could have skipped a generation, but we see evidence, and, and it could be that this is why we have the plague. So we're going to, we recognize it, and we see that maybe we're not loving like we should. Maybe we're not being that father or husband as we should. And we take responsibility and repent to you, Father, for this, and ask you to be, forgive us of our sins and to release us from the iniquities of our fathers that the power of this thing of the villain that's running from generation can be broken, that our seed can be blessed and not be carriers of this X chromosome defect and our family and our children, their children's children will never have bipolar again as long as they understand. You can teach your families if they want to listen. And they don't want to listen? Well, you know how God feels. Because he's truth, and sometimes nobody wants to listen. I'm going to go back over here and uh, go down through a couple of things before we take our break in five minutes here to get you some air. Depression, first of all, has a spiritual foundation. Unloving spirits, spirits of self-accusation, self-hatred. The familial spirits that make people feel like they're not loved and accepted. Then there's a psychological or psychogenic. And so, coming out of the mind. And there's physiological, the somatic expression. And there's chemical, like I talked about. Um, artificial sweeteners today. Oh, by the way. You don't need prayer because you've been using artificial sweeteners. What I would suggest you do, God created your body to detox unless you have fear. And if you have fear, your body will not detox properly. So you're going to have to come out of your fear for anything to work at all. Because whatsoever is not a faith is sin. I just quoted you a scripture. So if you'd like to consider some alternatives to um, sweeten things other than remodified pesticides or the other chemicals that are so dangerous and then make the change. There's a lot of good products out there. We use them in our home. And uh, they're easy to use, and they're not invasive, and um, you can even cook with them. Uh, and uh, that's what you do. Then Pastor Donna, my engineer of the home, would you come here now? Come on, gorgeous. If you've not met uh, Pastor Donna, my wife, here she is. They want to know what's an alternative to Splenda. And Stevia. Yeah. You know, Stevia used to be really nasty tasting, you know, and when it first started, the, it had a bitter taste. But they've got some really good stuff on the market right now. And I really like it. it granted, it doesn't taste like sugar. And so you have to kind of get used to it. But sometimes they actually have some Stevia sugar blends, pure cane sugar. And it's really yummy. And I think you could make the switch if you just really have your heart. It's better than tasting Splenda and NutraSweet and all those other nasty tasting things. Those are disgusting, really. And really, if you like those tastes, it's only because you got used to it and acclimated to it. So Stevie is really yummy. What else is it besides um, I, well, there's xylitol. There's, um, well, there's always honey. Mm. And that's all you can never lose with honey. So, and I have mine right here, uh, and he's very sweet. I'm biodegradable, too. <laughs> you are, yes. 
Thank you, Lord. Anyway, so I, those are just some. I mean, there's a lot of them on the market that you can look at, but I mean, not a lot. Uh, I think agave syrup is another one. There's a, but I just prefer uh, stevia. You know, we just we just uh, picked up a Coke product recently. I had one for lunch today, and and in the green can or the green bottle. Have you seen those yet? They're a mixture of uh, cane sugar and stevia. They're half the calories of regular Coke. Yeah, I mean. You know, you shouldn't drink a bunch of Cokes, okay? No. So we know that. No. But if you still want to have one from time to time, that is, it's really a good tasting product. I was really surprised. doesn't have any artificial sweeteners in it. Mm -mm. Nope. And uh, that's a possibility. It doesn't take too long to make the switch. And also, too, if you're still struggling with diabetes, stevia does not affect um, your sugars. So it's good, it's good for you. Also, I have to say something else that just normal sugar in moderation is not bad either. That's correct. I'll tell you why. That's because right. you can't make what God created evil. Can you? Now, there are, there are certain types of refinery processes that could be dangerous. So don't think I don't know that. But there's some natural sugars out there. Some of the refined stuff is, you know, is iffy. But there's some natural sugars that I use in coffee and so on. And if you know if you want to bake, you can go online and, and figure. There's a lot of good things out there that tells you how to bake either with stevia or other products that are not bad for you. So, and a little bit of sugar is okay too. So, that's that's my report. Thank you. Yes. Are you done? Yeah. Oh, okay. Woo! Hey everybody, it's Pastor Scott again. Depression keeps us focused on the negativity all around us that we cannot see the good when it comes. It robs us of our joy, steals us of our blessings. But we have good news for you. God has made a way of escape from the bondage to hopelessness, oppression, and heaviness. Now maybe you're taking massive amount of notes and are wondering, can I take all of this information in? Or maybe you're thinking I have someone I love who really needs to hear this. Well, if that's you, I have some great news for you. The complete teaching you're watching right now is available in book format. This teaching, along with all of the BN Health resources, are 20% off until midnight Sunday. Earlier, you may have seen the video highlighting our For My Life retreat here in Thomaston, Georgia. It really is an amazing week and completely life-changing. But we understand that not everyone can make it here to Georgia. And that is why we have created the For My Life Online. If you cannot make it in person to come see us, this is the next best option. During For My Life, you will learn the biblical principles and tools that will help you get free and stay free. We have thousands of testimonies of healing from all manner of disease as a result of the biblical information that is presented and the Holy Spirit working with everyone involved. For My Life takes one week to complete in person, but online we can give you up to three months to complete the course. This weekend only, we want to offer For My Life Online to you for $100 off. Just click the link below to register. And with that, we'll see you in a couple hours for the next session. Having the For My Life program online has been kind of a dream of ours because, you know, not everybody can come here at this time or any time. Maybe, maybe you're too sick or, or maybe just your life circumstances won't allow you to do that. I don't want you to think you're, feel, you're being cheated because you're not able to come here. God will meet you in a most amazing way. But the For My Life online to me is a very intimate time with the Lord. What I mean by that is, you know, some of my greatest breakthroughs with God have been in my prayer closet, or it's been I've heard something or I've read something in the scripture, and I didn't have the distractions of anyone around me to be able to thwart maybe what God was wanting to do in my life. It's also a time for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you things of your past, 
that brought you to the present, and, it, and, and he, that He can be able to speak to you and convict you and show you things that maybe you've never seen before. Because I know that when you hear these teachings, you are going to hear things that, yes, you may have read so many times, or maybe never, but, they're, the, but, but God's going to ignite something in the times that you hear this. And you are going to be able to just totally surrender to Him, vulnerability, and also humility. Also, too, because you're reflecting on the past that brought you to the present, we also give you hope for the future. The thing is, is that before God, He begins to ignite things in that be still and know that I am God moment, where He shows you, oh my goodness, I have tools to overcome forever and ever. For as long as I'm here on this earth, I can overcome. So I really hope that you consider taking the For My Life online, not for us, but for you.